Here I've set up the top fuselage half on the bottom fuselage half temporarily and tonight the first task is to cut out the openings for the two fin spars. On the surface of the fuselage top half there's a little impression to show you exactly where to cut the aperture. That's where the front fin spar goes through and then at the back there's another mark just there for the rear fin spar. And whilst we are cutting out holes, we're also going to do the wing cutout. There it is there on the side of the fuselage, on the other side as well. I've rubbed pencil on the marks to make them more visible. There's the rear one, there's the front one. Here's the pencil mark, and here's the ideal tool for cutting it out. One millimeter, 115 millimeter angle grinder disc steel cutting blade. Right, there's the rear hole cut out. There's the front hole cut out, and I've used a round file that you can see here just to round the corners. Next trick is to try and insert the fin spars from below. For that I'll have to take the top half off and place it on trestles. There's the front spar in place. I just had to trim off a little bit of material with a rough piece of sandpaper on a block, just enough to allow it to enter through the hole. There it is now for the back one. There are the two spars in their approximate end positions. The rear spar worked out to 32 millimeters wide, the full length, and the front spar is 35 millimeters up to the kink, thereafter 32 millimeters. Here's the lower fuselage half upside down. I'm now going to cut out the wing spar cutouts. Again, there's a mark on the part which I've highlighted with pencil. There's the first cutout complete, and the corners have been radiused with a round file. This is a nose wheel whisper, hence the undercarriage attachment point is just aft of the wing spar cut out. If you're building a tail dragger the undercarriage attachment point will be over there. On this project I've chosen to temporarily install the undercarriage early so as to have something to stand the blower fuselage on whilst doing further work. So what I've done so far is I've centralized, I've inserted the carry through spar, one of the planks, the rear one, and I've centralized it. And to do that I've allowed equal lengths of the carry through spar to stick out of each side of the fuselage and also ensured that its center line is halfway between the two undercarriage cutouts, that one and that one. This being a nose wheel version, the steel backing for the undercarriage I've shortened to 485 millimeters either side of center line. The center line of the carry through spar is scribed on the part. There's the line. I've put the center line of the steel backing in line with that mark. Leave a gap of about three millimeters between the steel backing and the rear face of the carry through spar to allow for the glass that's ultimately going to be in that position. And once you've got all this set up, you can drill through at this point and the corresponding point on the other side with a 10 millimeter drill and then you can temporarily attach the undercarriage legs. The carry through spar is in position just three to four millimeters aft of the cutout. There it is there. I've marked the holes with a pencil and the center line of the carry through spar is on aircraft center line. The undercarriage legs are now in place. This being a nose wheel, the rounded edge of the undercarriage leg is aft and the cut edge is forward. On the tail drag it will be the other way around. There's the 10 millimeter bolt or temporary one in, in the hole. And there's the undercarriage backing in position. The next task is to trim the joggle to 40 millimeter width. The 
In this area right at the firewall there's a double joggle overlap. This top joggle rides on top of the lower joggle and to allow it all to fit properly a small square needs to be cut out. Mine is already cut out and removed and the edges rounded off until you get a good fit between top and bottom fuselage halves. The top cowling joggle must be trimmed to the same width as the lower cowling joggle. This one measures 38 millimeters. So I'm going to trim the top cowl joggle to 38 millimeters as well. The lower edge of the top fuselage half needs to be trimmed. Again, coarse sandpaper. I'm temporarily attaching the top and bottom halves together using drywall screws, 4mm drywall screws, 2.5mm hole works well. Three screws are in and now I'm going to do the other side. The important starting point is to get the cowling joggle to line up precisely and work from here backwards, left hand side, right hand side and alternate. All the screws are now in, top and bottom, bottom halves are now temporarily joined together. What I've also done at the back here is I've inserted the fin spars and the right hand fin skin temporarily. The secret of doing this easily is to use the pre-drilled holes in the fin skin the ribs and the spars and insert screws in those holes. This is the area where the horizontal stabilizer cutout is going to be. Below it are the two screws aligning the lower fin rib and there are the two screws aligning the top fin rib. Here's a view from the left hand side. There's the top fin rib. There's the lower fin rib. This area in here is going to be cut out ultimately and the horizontal stabilizer will slide in backwards. At the top of the fin there are also two screws that align with the top of the fin spars. There are pre-drilled holes in those as well. These are roller blade wheels, inline skate wheels, which are quite useful for moving the aeroplane around the work area until you get your main undercarriage installed later. I'm now preparing for bonding. Here's the top fuselage half inverted and all the screw holes are in position and it's time to remove the peel ply. This is the peel ply, you can see the red stripes in the peel ply to warn you of its presence. And once you get an edge loose, rip it off. Once the peel ply has been removed, it's a good idea to still sand lightly. And on joints where there is no peel ply, you need to vigorously sand. There's the bottom half that still needs to be sanded on the joggle. vital that this joggle is completely roughened and the way to do that is to sand vigorously and then with a clean brush brush away the dust and make sure that there are no shiny spots like there for example there's still some shiny area which means it's not ground right down to the face of the little depressions that's better now also make sure that you sand this face so there's a proper bond on this horizontal surface as well. So fold the sandpaper and get right into the pan. You have 
absolutely vital this joint and it's going to take a good few hours to go all the way around the joggle these are small chipboard blocks that I've cut up and I'm bonding them onto this large side here with automotive body putty and the idea is that when you screw the drywall screws in to hold the two halves together there will be a better grip because the screws are going into this into, into these little chipboard blocks Roughly every 150 millimeters there's a chipboard block. In areas where there were slight waves in the fuselage trying to form, I've put the blocks a little bit closer together, around about 100 millimeters apart. The fuselage halves are now bonded together. This took about just over a kilogram of resin and cotton flux mixture. First, I painted all the bond surfaces with a layer of resin and then apply cotton flock liberally to both surfaces and then we put the two together trying not to scrape off too much of the cotton flock mixture and then inserted all the screws and tightened them. In this first phase, this first gluing phase, we've glued the two halves together and the front fin spar only. The rest is all in position, the two ribs and the right hand fin skin but those are not bonded yet, that'll be phase two. It's vital that this front fin spar is vertical and to get this right I have a plumb bob set up over there and the string of the plumb bob goes through the center line of the fin spar. The aircraft is also level. I put straight edges across the canopy sills and put a spirit level on top of that and then shim the undercarriage legs until the aeroplane is absolutely level. Wipe off as much of the cotton flock excess as you can at this stage because it's a lot easier now than once it's cured. This is a view into the rear of the aircraft. In some places the screws didn't pull the halves together properly so I've used pop rivets here and there to pull the halves together properly. Once it's cured, we'll grind all these off. I'm now preparing for bonding in of the rear fin spar. All the surfaces are roughened and uh, ready for cotton flux. I've marked a vertical line on the front fin spar and the original plumb bob is still in place. The rear spar has been scuffed on the bond area and there's a plumb bob in place and a line drawn on the rear of that spar. The rear fin spar is now bonded in place and there's the plumb bob lining up precisely with the vertical line drawn on the rear face of the fin spar. The second plumb bob on the front fin spar is also still in position and it's hanging down and is on the center line of the aircraft just ahead of the rear fin spar. Sighting along the top of the fin, that's also in line with the aircraft center line. Although the fin is still quite floppy, once the left hand skin is bonded on finally then it will become quite rigid. But it's a good time to just check that it is in fact in line with the flight path of the aircraft. In this phase I've only bonded in the rear fin spar and the ribs and the right hand fin skin will be bonded on in the next phase. During bonding I'm holding the rear fin spar in place with two clamps and a pop rivet at the lower end. The rear fin spar is now bonded in place. I've removed the right hand fin skin and I've marked all the bond areas. All the areas I've marked need to be thoroughly roughened with sandpaper so that the right hand fin skin can be bonded in place. 
we're ready to bond on the right hand fin skin the area has been thoroughly roughened there's where the lower end of the fin skin attaches and the fin spars themselves are also thoroughly roughened the fin skin is also roughened in all the bond areas I've applied cotton flocks to both bonding surfaces and a thin layer on the thin skin as well. The right thin skin is bonded on. Pop rivets about every 100 millimeters to hold it securely in place during bonding. Also pop rivets on the thin spars about every 150 millimeters. Make sure the fin ribs are absolutely horizontal with the aircraft still level. Same for the top fin rib. Make sure that the space between the fin ribs is slightly less off than it is at the front. This will allow the tailplane to enter easily. Okay. Make sure the fin center line, the split line, is exactly on aircraft center line. The fin skin is going to be trimmed this piece here is going to be trimmed away ultimately but during curing make sure that there is cotton flock up to about this point this cavity underneath here is not a problem that's going to get trimmed off and fed in with micro balloons later clean away all excess cotton flock with your finger on the inside for the firewall you need four tough knoll discs 52 millimeter diameter I've cut them out of a 6 millimeter piece of tough knoll with a 52 diameter hole saw 52 diameter hole saw is the same size you'll need ultimately if you use automotive engine instruments to cut the holes out of your instrument panel this is the page in the manual F11 where the layout of the firewall is shown the engine mount attached bolts with the aircraft level again, establish the center line, draw a vertical line and from it measure the four engine mount attach points. Drill a small pilot hole through each of the, of the marks, right through the firewall as well, through the plywood. When you receive the kit, the thin fiberglass firewall is not in the correct shape. So to get this right, you need to put in the plywood from behind. When you receive the plywood, it is marked out with the firewall. Cut, it, cut the firewall out and push it in to position. This will force the top fuselage half into the correct shape. Once the plywood is in position, trim the top of the firewall, the fiberglass, to the correct shape and then ensure that the airplane is absolutely symmetrical. This top front area of the top fuselage half. The left front tends to be low and this area needs to be pushed up. If the plywood is put in place it should push this point up and get the front of the airplane symmetrical left to right. I've removed the plywood firewall and where there were pilot holes drilled I've opened the holes up to 52 diameter with the hole saw and I've bonded in those tough knoll discs in the four engine mount points. The purpose of the tough knoll discs is so that the wood does not compress when you tighten the engine mount bolts. A solid laminate of fiberglass would also work, 6 millimeters. I've just bonded these discs in with cotton flock. I'm about to put in the lower engine mount strengthening points. These consist of 280 gram per square meter fiberglass strips, 140 millimeters wide. 10 layers in total. This is the nose wheel whisper, so they're going to run from the cutout. I've marked it with dotted pencil lines. The longest layer will run from the cutout all the way to the firewall, over the hole, and up onto the firewall by 150 millimeters. It'll progressively get shorter to the 10th layer, which is ending 300 millimeters after the firewall. There's where the fiberglass is going to extend onto the firewall by 150 millimeters and the shortest layer ends there at 300 millimeters after the firewall. 
on the tail dragger whisper it's only necessary to bring the longest layer back as far as the undercarriage stiffening cavity. I'm now busy cutting the fiberglass strips for the engine mount strengthening points. There's the roll of fiberglass laid out on a table and I've cut the first strip off at 45 degrees. The strip's 140 millimeters wide. To get the 45 degree angle you can either use a large set square or if you look on the actual fiberglass there are lines evident which, which are 45 degrees to the axis of the roll. It's particularly evident on this 280 gram tool weave. Once you've cut the strips, you can trim the ends off to 90 degrees and then be careful they're quite easy to stretch out of shape. So to avoid that happening, roll them up into tidy little rolls which you can then use as required. The fibers on these strips are obviously lying at 45 degrees across the roll. That's why it's very easy to stretch out of shape. The glass is also very easy to drape around sharp corners, etc., when it's cut at 45 degrees. I'm going to mix some resin, Ampreg 22 resin. The scale is on and zeroed. I'm pouring in some resin. That's about as much as I'm going to need for now. That is 151 grams. In fact, 152 grams. Calculator, 152 times 1.28 equals 195 grams is the total I must bring it to as I add the hardener. Here's the hardener, slow hardener in this case. I must take it to 195 grams and that will be the correct mix ratio. grams. Mix it thoroughly and it's ready to apply. This is the lower engine mount point. The area has been thoroughly scuffed with coarse sandpaper. First I'm going to paint on resin onto the entire area to be glassed. You should wear gloves and protective eyewear in this case, in case of resin splashes. I've painted the entire area and now I'm going to carefully roll on the first layer of glass. Unrolling it as I go along, making sure it retains its proper width. to go. I'll trim that off in a moment. Then you can start dabbing it down with a brush. The secret here is not to apply too much resin, but just enough to wet out the glass. When you paint the resin on, paint the entire area as though you were painting a wall. Don't continue until it's wet out right where you're working. By the time you've painted the entire area, you'll see that in fact it is wet most of the places. And you can just go back and wet out the areas that are still dry. Notice how that area is becoming wet out. The ideal resin ratio is 50% by mass to the glass. And this is difficult to achieve with a layup like this unless you are very careful. This is the second layer. I've made marks here to show where the layers end. First layer, second, third, fourth, fifth, etc. up to the tenth layer over there. I'll place the pencil there to remind me where I am with each layer. That's 
the sixth layer I've got gone on. I'm just about to wet it out. The others are all wet out. Don't try and wet out a layer unless all the layers below are completely wet out. In other words, wet out layer by layer. Here's the tenth layer. Once this is complete, same on the other side. We have the ten layers in on the left hand side and the right hand side. I'm preparing to do the top engine mount strengthening points. So I've inverted the aeroplane. It's supported on trestles on the canopy saw and it's hanging by a rope over there. There's the lower strengthening strips which we applied just now. And there first has to be a layer of glass closing or connecting the top skin to the firewall. That'll go in first, all the way around there, 100 millimeter wide strip of fiberglass. And then here is the top right engine mount point. Again, 150 millimeters onto the cowling, 140 wide strips, which go back past the canopy sill, the start of the canopy sill, by 200 millimeters. Longest strip is there, 200 millimeters aft of the front of the canopy sill, and the shortest one, 300 millimeters from the firewall and stagger them, there's the 10 layers staggered or where they're going to be. Here's the first of the two layers that joins the top fuselage half to the firewall. The strips that join the top fuselage half to the firewall are now in place, two strips, and the first of the 10 layers for the top engine mount strengthening point is in place and must be wet out. There's the canopy saw and that's as far as the longest one extends. We have the top left engine mount 10 layers in place. Bottom left, 10 layers in place. And the lower ones. As well as the two layers that connect the firewall to the top fuselage half. Here I'm applying the cotton flock to the front face of the firewall. I'm using an applicator shaped like that to give an even spread of about three millimeter thick ridges of cotton flock all over the firewall. The rear face of the fiberglass firewall is now roughened and ready for bonding in of the plywood. Cotton flux is now applied to the inside face of the firewall and to the forward face of the plywood. To hold the plywood in position during curing, I've placed a temporary chipboard on the front of the firewall and a number of wooden scrap timber strips and I've screwed the plywood into it from inside with long drywall screws. I also put 6mm bolts through the engine mounting points and tightened those and there you can see a number of drywall screws going through the firewall pulling it firmly against the chipboard on the outside. Before using the drywall screws I sprayed a thin layer of oil on them, penetrating oil on them which helps to get them out afterwards otherwise they're going to be bonded tight. The top engine mount points are now complete. And the 
I've been busy on the project for 28 hours now, over seven days part time. The right fin skin is bonded on, cured, and the pop rivets have been drilled out. The screw holes and the joggles have been filled with cotton flock. The firewall plywood is bonded in, and the screws have been removed, and the temporary wood on the front has been removed. All that remains here is for the lower 10 layers to be installed and then once that's cured the final single layer over the back face of the plywood firewall. The front face of the firewall has been sanded in preparation for bonding of the stainless steel firewall. Make sure there are no voids, in this case there aren't any, it was pulled firmly against the plywood. And importantly the firewall is in plane, it's absolutely flat because the board that was attached to it ensured that it was absolutely flat. All the engine mounting layers are now in place including the lower 10 layers on the right hand side and the left hand side. Page F8 in the manual calls for extra layers connecting the fin spars to the fuselage. Two layers of 280 gram per square meter glass at 45 degrees, 100 millimeters wide over there, and the same over here. As usual, bond area is thoroughly roughened with coarse sandpaper. There are the layers in place. On this whisper, I've opted to go for the air exit tunnel. To make that I've bent up from half millimeter stainless steel that triangular shaped ramp that you see there. It's 600 millimeters long, it's 110 high at the front and it's 230 millimeters wide. I've put it in with two layers of 280 gram glass all over it extending about 50 millimeters onto the bottom of the aeroplane and onto the firewall. Once this is set up, we'll turn the aircraft over and cut out the tunnel underneath, leaving the shiny inside of the stainless steel. The top surface of the stainless, onto which the glass is bonded, has been thoroughly roughened before applying the glass. Sandblast or grinder. Tonight we also chipped off all the chipboard blocks and carefully ground the joints smooth inside. Tonight we've bonded the stainless steel firewall in place, thoroughly roughened the rear surface and the fiberglass onto which it attaches, we applied cotton flocks to both sides in much the same way as when we attached the plywood, and then pulled it down with the four engine mount bolts, as well as the other timber that you can see there. I've also applied the final layer of glass to the rear face of the plywood firewall as well as an extra two layers of 100mm wide around the stainless steel air exit triangle. This is the rear undercarriage bulkhead made from 6mm plywood cut to suit the shape of the area directly behind the undercarriage channel and here I've got it tacked in position with cotton flock. Once this is set up, I'll remove the clamps and apply the layers of fiberglass behind it. To leave space for the fiberglass that's ultimately going to be in this area where the undercarriage channel is, I've put in 3mm spaces, or cuts of perspex in this case, between the plywood and the bulkhead, so as to leave a 3mm gap in there. There the other spaces. I've also trimmed the firewall tunnel and bent over the stainless steel, made a 20 millimeter flange all the way around. I 
I've now made the front bulkhead uh, the one at the front of the seat module and tacked it in place with cotton flock if you were building the tail dragger whisper you would do this quite early on in the process because this bulkhead would be the one that defines the front position of the undercarriage bulkhead or undercarriage steel channel rather to determine the exact position of that bulkhead I've temporarily installed the seat module and its front edge defines the position of that bulkhead I've temporarily clamped the bulkhead to the front face of the seat module whilst the cotton flock is curing once the cotton flock is cured I'll loosen the clamps, take the seat module out and apply the fiberglass layers to the front and back of that bulkhead This is the bulkhead that was made previously, the one at the rear edge of the channel, the steel undercarriage channel, and as you can see it contacts the bottom of the seat module and has to be trimmed until a good fit is found between it and the seat module. In the tail dragger whisper this bulkhead will not be used at all. This is the bulkhead just aft of the seat module, 25 millimeter 24 kilogram per cubic meter density polystyrene cut to shape the edge that connects to the seat module I've beveled for a good fit with the seat module and I'm going to take the fiberglass layers on this side over and down onto the hardboard sheet that I have there that will effectively close out the top edge and give a better bond to the seat module this is the cable guide bulkhead which is normally made from 6mm plywood I've elected to make it out of fiberglass as well and instead of making it a half bulkhead I've made, a, made it a full bulkhead which will just allow you enough space to get your arm through to feed cables etc through this is the top of the bulkhead 630 high total height and then the cutout I've made 270 from the lower edge to allow this entire area to accept all the Teflon bushes that are required for the cable guide bulkhead. I've also beveled this inside face and I'm going to lay up fiberglass over and down onto the table so that there's close out on the inside of the bulkhead. I've roughened the, the polystyrene with coarse sandpaper and now I'm going to squeegee on a thin slurry of micro balloon and then apply the two layers of 190 gram glass at 45 degrees to both sides of these bulkheads. The micro balloon forced into the polystyrene beads gives a good grip between the fiberglass and the polystyrene. There are the two layers applied and to the other bulkhead. I'm now going to apply four layers of 280 gram per square meter glass aft of that bulkhead, that's the undercarriage rear bulkhead the same to the aft the other four layers in place extending 100 millimeters onto the bottom of the aircraft this bulkhead, the one at the front end of the seat module gets two layers of 280 gram per square meter cloth on the front and back faces in much the same way as the rear bulkhead these two bulkheads have also been turned over and two layers applied to the other side Page FC4 shows the cable guide bulkhead and the Teflon tubes and their method of attachment. Here is the cable guide bulkhead with the Teflon tubes in position. And this cable guide bulkhead is different to the one in the manual in that I've made it a full ring with an oval cutout just to get your hand through for feeding cables through etc. It's polystyrene with two layers of 190 gram glass on either side.
This is the bulkhead at the back of the seat module. There you can see the closeout at the top edge. And that closeout is going to bond onto the seat module. That's the connection between the seat module and the bulkhead at the top of the bulkhead. And the bulkhead is also going to bond to that elbow molding. That's the approximate position of the bulkhead. The area has been roughened and I'm going to now bond it in. And once that's cured, add layers of fiberglass to the front and back of the bulkhead in the fillet to connect it to the fuselage. There's the bulkhead in position. I determined the exact position by putting in the seat module temporarily and positioning the bulkhead accordingly. It's bonded in with micro balloons. Normally one wouldn't use micro for a, for a bond. However, in this case, because the edge of the bulkhead is polystyrene, it's pointless using cotton flock there. So I've just bonded it in with micro balloon. And the next phase will be to put the glass fillet front and back onto the fuselage side. The blue pipe is just a spacer to hold the aeroplane at the correct width to suit the seat module. The cable guide bulkhead is also in position using micro balloon. The bulkhead behind the seat module is now glassed in. Two layers of 190 gram cloth at 45 degrees either side. That's the front face. And the rear bulkhead is also done in the same way. The reason I've inverted the aircraft again is to install the strengthening layers for the top nose wheel mounting point. Which is directly between the two top engine mount bolts. To make the aircraft easy to turn over, I've supported it at the firewall by means of a chain block and I've made a plate that can pivot. In this case I've installed the mock-up fire, the mock-up engine mount from which I have that pivot arrangement. Rear end I've just support, supported the aircraft with that piece of rope and in this way I can actually rotate the aircraft single-handedly. The optional air exit tunnel is also visible here on the underside of the aircraft. There are the nose wheel mounting layers in place. 10 layers, approximately 140 wide, 200 long extending 100 millimeters up the firewall and 100 millimeters along the top fuselage skin, almost up to the fuel filler cap cutout. And that's 280 gram glass cut at 45 degrees. Here we've got the aeroplane on its side and we're busy preparing the joint between the top and bottom fuselage half. We thoroughly roughened the joint area and there's a mixture of micro balloon which has got 30% by mass micro added and there I've roughly applied it with a putty knife and I'm about to spline it with a straight rule. Okay. I'm curving the ruler as best I can to suit the shape of the aeroplane and dragging it along and that way there will be a minimum amount of sanding afterwards. I've cleaned the rule and now I'm going to re-spline from here onwards. Stop now and clean the rule. This is the correct consistency for the micro, with thirty per cent micro powder added the resin, apply it thick and then spline it off. Bend the ruler to suit and then pull. Minor imperfections like that in the splining are best left 
until the micro is cured and then just fill those in. If you try and fix those now, method to sand, keep the sanding block aligned with the axis of the aeroplane and move it across at 45 degrees this way and then this way. Sanding block has got coarse anti grip sandpaper on it which you can change often and make sure the micro is completely cured before you attempt to sand. Here I've temporarily attached the left fin skin so that I could accurately mark out the horizontal stabilizer cutout. I've cut those out and I've cut out the circular inspection cover. The left fin skin will only get bonded on much later. At this stage it's held temporarily in place with a few pop rivets which I'll drill out. I've now completed the sanding of the fuselage joints and I've applied a layer of filler spray. I've used a high quality automotive two-pack filler spray and the whole aeroplane has been thoroughly roughened using sandpaper on a long block and as before keeping the axis of the the sanding block in line with the aircraft axis at all times. Now that the filler spray is on minor imperfections are easier to see and these can be filled. Every part that has been painted has been roughened to ensure a good grip of the paint on the fiberglass. This is the product I used. It's called a 2K Fill Primer and I use a conventional high pressure gravity feed gun to spray it. Here we're ready to start building a Whisper Express wing. That's the 11.8 meter wing, which requires eight blocks of foam. There they all are. The first step is to trim all the blocks to size and to get them perfectly square. When you receive the blocks, they tend to be concave or convex. So the first task is to cave side, place that on the table and then trim off five millimeters taking it down to 225 millimeters we order the blocks at 230 and then finally taking it down to 220 cutting on the other side here we've got a hot wire cutter set up on the table at precisely 225 millimeters above the surface we then turn it on and slide the block through Once this step is done, what was the convex side is now on top and it is now perfectly flat and the block is 225 thick. We turn it over, reset the hot wire to 220 and then make the final trim to 220. That way both sides of the block will be perfectly flat. For a hot wire power source we're using a normal arc welder set onto high and to regulate the temperature we've got a bit of stainless steel locking wire set up on this resistor block here and we move it as required to get the right temperature. Here's the way we've attached the hot wire cutter to the table. The nylon block there is just to insulate between, between the two sides of the cutter. Here's the conventional hot wire bow which we're going to use later on for cutting the wing sections. There's the top 5mm slice off, the block's now 225. I'm going to reset it now to 220, turn all the blocks over and cut the others. To make it easy to measure, we've got... This is the wire we use for hot wiring. Stainless steel aircraft locking wire does work fine, but we've found that this is even stronger. This is stainless steel high tensile fishing trace. We're using 56 kilogram braking strain. The hot wire is now on and I'm going to push it through gently. The 
need to experiment with the temperature to get the ideal temperature. The wire must definitely not glow red. You'll see by the quality of the cut whether you have the right temperature or not. I'm just applying a reasonable pressure to it here to get the right speed. We put plastic on the table just to make the block slide a bit more easily. Quite a bow in the wire at the moment, but that's not going to affect the flatness of this surface. When you cut the wing section, you're probably going to go a bit more slowly because any bow in the wire is going to cause an inaccuracy in your cut because then you're cutting around a curve, not a straight line like this. Should the wire break at any point, quickly push the block through to drag the wire out as quick as you can because that hot wire lying inside the foam will cause damage. Once you've repaired the wire, then you can put in cold again, switch on and continue without too much damage to the surface of the foam. That's done. Cut her off. The block should be 220 millimeters. Now, same for the other block. Here I've set up the four blocks that make up the Whisper Express wing. They must all be 1.3 meters long and their ends square. I've also put on template one and its lower half on the inner face. And using a large square, I've made two marks there that indicate the spar cutout. Now once you've set up all the blocks in their correct positions, you can extend that line right to the wingtip, indicating the exact position of the spar. And then the blocks will always be positioned according to those lines to keep that spar straight and perpendicular to station one here. If you're building the motor glider, the first floor, four blocks will be 1100 millimeters long and the last three will be one meter long. On the Express all the blocks are 1.3 meters long. Here you can see that template one is actually overhanging the edge of the foam slightly. Unfortunately some foam manufacturers cannot make a block big enough for this first station on the Whisper Express. So here all that will have to happen is we'll cut it as you see it there and ultimately add on a small piece on the leading edge. Most of this, however, will fall into the wing root area, which gets cut off in any case. On the motor glider wing, this will not be necessary, because the long side of the block will run across the cord of the wing, and there will be no need to add anything on. The foam is 24 kilogram per cubic meter density white expanded polystyrene, on both aircraft, the motor glider and the express. To slice off the end of the block, I've set up two straight edges nailed into the foam that are nice and square to the block and I've inclined the block slightly, you'll see there's a spacer under there and the idea is that the weight of the bow itself will pull it through and stay against the straight edges. Now I've turned it on. And that's the only way it is pulling it through. The 
this is the right wing which we've got laid out here the four blocks we've squared off the ends and cut the blocks to 1.3 meters length and we've now marked out the position of the main spar there it is at station one perfectly squared to template one and then using a line we've strung the line right across to the other end to the wingtip and we've made sure that the line crosses the templates at the correct points in other words at the spar position this will ensure that the spar is absolutely straight wingtip to wingtip position the block so that the end of each template is at least in line with the end of the foam like that here's template 5 the position of template 5 which is the wingtip of the express wing this is a little piece we had to add to the leaning edge at station 1 due to the fact that the block of foam was not quite big enough but we've cut it out and bonded it in place I'm ready to on edge are you on? yes I'm at the edge switching on right, on the bleeding ramp going in halfway okay and I'm somewhere I'm approaching the cutout for the spoiler cutout I'm on it on it 18 ok and then now half Good 19 no, 20 I'm um, now 20 I think I'm hitting a hard patch or something. 21. Mm -hmm. 6 Slow down a bit. Mm -hmm. Slow down about half now. Almost there. Almost there. In yeah. the corner, pause. Pausing. And along the flat, halfway. Okay. And out. Down a bit behind. Yeah, I'll just slow down a bit. A bit cut the spoiler cut out. I'm going to take a little bridge off. We're going to 
cut this piece out here. Going in. Me too. Halfway down. Yep. At the end, pause. Pausing. And on our way to one, we're at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Pause at the exit and up. Normally we would cut the spar cap out at this time. But this is the wrong template for the express wing, so we'll do that later. Um, resting on there. Switch on. one. Half. Okay. Corner. Okay. Pause. And up we go. Half. Slowly. One. Half. Two. Half. Three. Half. Four. Half. Five. Half. Six. Half. Seven. Half. Eight. Half. Nine. Half. Onto the bridge. Half. Eleven. Half. Twelve. Half. Thirteen. Twenty-three. Half. Twenty-four. Good. Half. Twenty-five. Seven. Okay. okay, slowing down to the corner. Okay, I'm still trying to get there. Five more to go. I'm on it now. Okay, 36, pausing a little bit in the corner. Okay. And rising up. Halfway up the vertical. On the top. Okay. On the flat. Oh, cool. away. Alright. Halfway. Okay. Three quarters. Let's oh. slow again. Okay, around the corner. Not yet. Now. Descending in the corner of the bottom pause. Okay. And out. This is hard. Here we're preparing to cut out the spar portion of the wing. We've put straight edges on the rear face of the spar and we're going to cut vertically through there to split the wing. Okay, going on. Applying slight pressure backwards to hold the wire against the template, against the straight edge. Just grab this bit for when it falls. About 25 millimeters to go. Yeah. Twenty more to go. 
I'm a little bit more. Cleaning them. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, now catch the piece. Where the spar portion is cut out, and we're now going to do it to all the other blocks as well. There, all the spar portions have been cut out of the foam blanks. Here we've laid out the spar foam and we're busy marking the center line on both sides of this. Exactly in the middle, the center line drawn all the way along the foam block and the same on the other side. Center lines are now marked on both foam blocks on both sides and the next task is to cut off the spar cap material. Page W13 in the manual indicates how much material must be removed from the foam for the spar caps. This wing we're cutting right now is an express so the amounts are slightly different but they will appear on page W13 of the respective manual. To do this I've set up straight edges on both sides. In this case it's an express wing so it's 22 millimeters coming off at station 1 and 12 millimeters off the other end. I've set up the hot wire in the vise so that I can single-handedly cut off this piece. Turning on. And the other side. We're going to cut these blocks in half. We've set up this space here to be precisely such that the wire is on the center line of the block. There we go. All the spar caps are now cut off and the foam blocks are cut in half. We're preparing to bond all the pieces together and we've laid them out so that the middle face is up in all four cases. This is L1. This is the right wing, station 1. I have here an arrowhead indicating up and an arrowhead indicating up. The M on the top face and the M on the top face indicates that that's the middle of the spar. The two faces ultimately will be glued together. We've drawn a fresh center line on the top face of all of these blocks which we're going to make absolutely straight when we bond all the segments together. The micro balloon that we bonded together with will squeeze out slightly and attach to the table to hold them in position for when we make the actual shear webs. We've used packaging tape as release on the wooden tabletop. Three rolls of packaging tape did the whole surface, which is a lot cheaper than any other type of plastic one could use. 
all the pieces are joined together with the center lines exactly straight. We use the gut line to get them straight. Just use there's the joint we've used micro balloon to join the blocks together. Approximately 30% by mass micro powder mixed with the resin. And the weights are just to hold the polystyrene down whilst it's curing. The plywood inserts are cut out according to the dimensions on page W22. You then need to trim off the end of the spar foam to suit the end of the plywood, like you see there. And the position of the plywood in the foam is according to page W16.2. And it's important to get the position of the pin exactly at the right distance from station zero, which we've marked on the table over there. Station zero is aircraft center line. So we're now going to laminate the seven pieces of plywood together and then attach them to the end of the foam once we finish that. Here are the plywood inserts which I'm busy laminating. Seven pieces make up each plywood insert. I put wax paper between every seventh piece to stop that bonding together. And I've got a piece of threaded rod which is passing through a hole which is ultimately the wing pin hole. Once the plywood inserts have been removed and trimmed, they'll be positioned here and attached to the spar foam. The plywood inserts have been trimmed. We laminated them and trimmed them and tacked them to the table surface using micro. And we've also bonded them to the foam using micro balloons that you can see there. There's no need to use cotton flock for this bond because you are just bonding plywood to foam and the micro balloon is adequate. The edge of the plywood we've also radiused to allow the glass to drape nicely over there and all the way down the side of the foam we've put on about a 5mm radius. The center line is drawn all the way down the foam and, and you must ensure that this center line is straight from station zero all the way to the end of the wing. We finished the first three shear web halves with all four layers <coughs> as per the schedule and we're about to do the fourth one. There you can see we've wet out the plywood with resin and we put cotton flock on the edges or we're about to do that. We're putting a thin cotton flock slurry over the plywood to ensure that the resin really soaks into the end grain of the plywood. Next is we're going to put micro slurry on the polystyrene. We're going to mix up a thin micro slurry and squeegee it on. This is the consistency of the micro we're using. And you squeegee it hard into the polystyrene. It ensures a good grip between the fiberglass and the polystyrene. Do the whole shear web and the sides. Here's the fiberglass we're using, 190 gram glass, 300 millimeters wide, cut at 45 degrees off the roll. Place it nicely on the middle. Unroll it, be careful not to stretch it, because as you stretch it, it will get narrower than the 300 that's required. down the sides you'll see that it drapes easily because it's cut at 45 degrees and of course all the corners are radius which helps we have got to ensure that we leave enough space here for the spar cap this is 22 millimeters on the express and 35 on the motor glider here at the root end this is where the first piece, e piece ends and the second piece starts we're using the standard 25 millimeter overlap that you can see there between the layers. And it's two full layers along the full length of the shear web. And then a third layer that ends as per the plan 
over there somewhere and a fourth layer that ends down here. We finished the layup and the temperature for tonight is predicted to be below 18 degrees C. So we've built this tent over the spars using plastic and in there we've got two oil heaters which are just keeping the temperature at around about 25 degrees C. The four spar hogs are now cured and we've now roughened all the faces ready for bonding. We've left two of them attached to the table and the outer two we've released. And they're going to be positioned ultimately like that with cotton flock bonding the two halves together to form the eye section spar. We've now bonded the two halves together with cotton flock. We ran a bead of cotton flock along the center line of the one half and placed the other half on top of it and use a short straight edge and make sure that the two halves are absolutely flush working from the one end along and once you're sure that they are take a nail sharpened to a nice sharp point and push it into the foam through both halves so that you securely hold them together and then move along a bit further and do the same because it's vital that the two halves bond together with an absolutely straight edge here so that the spar lines up with the foam cores ultimately. The next job is to trim the spar caps. Page W16.4 gives the dimensions. The black line is visible, that's the trim line. This is the rear face of the spar and at station 1 it's 91 millimeters from the center line out to where I've got the black line there and the same from the center line to the other side and by station 2 it's reduced make a mark at station 2 and at station 1 and then connect the two with a straight line and now we're going to trim those off is now trimmed both sides and ready to assemble the wing. Here we've temporarily assembled the wing sitting in the lower polystyrene cutout just to see that the spar fits exactly with the polystyrene cores. The edge of the spar should be flush with the polystyrene all the way along if you've cut correctly. The next job is to cut the unidirectional glass for the spar caps. The product we're using is called Unitex 500. It's a uni unidirectional glass. The cross fibers are bonded on and each bundle is basically a 1200 tex roving bundle. Now we require 90 millimeter width which works out to 40 1200 tex bundles. So the best way to slit up this glass is instead of measuring each time, rather count the bundles. Count 40 bundles and then take a sharp, very very sharp knife like this, one of these box cutter knives. And then once you've counted the 40 bundles, put in the blade and then just run down and separate it. The blade will remain between two bundles all the way down. Page W18 of the manual gives the schedule of all the lengths of glass that you need to cut. So what we're doing here is we've placed a long tape measure on the table and we're now going to cut glass as per page W18 and stack it ready for laminating into the spar cap. The longest layer is going to go into the laminate first so when you stack it on your table stack it with the longest layer on top and the shortest layer at the bottom.
once you've cut the glass, if you're not going to use it straight away, wrap it in plastic to avoid too much moisture absorption. Do not try and roll up these 90 millimeter wide strips of glass. Keep them flat. If you do try and roll them up, the little fibers start coming apart and you're going to have a big mess. As far as I now set up for laminating the spar caps, and we've chosen to do them outside of the wing. The important thing here is to check that that center line is absolutely straight. On the motor glider you'll have to shim here and there to get it straight because of the slight crank in the wing. This is the express wing and it should be absolutely straight lying on the table like this. Here's the temporary ramp we've built on the end of the spar to support the fibers that run from the end of the spar to station zero. We've just attached it with automotive body filler. The top surface of the little ramp is directly in line with the center line. We've got our third layer in now. Longest layer is first, getting shorter and shorter. There are all the pre-cut layers lying ready to use. We put cotton flocks in that little gap between the two halves, painted the whole length with resin and then placed the first layer in, wet it out thoroughly, squeegee it a bit, add the next layer and so on. Don't try and put down a number of dry layers and then try and wet them out. PG lightly and get all the excess resin out and make the fibers as straight as possible. And we're preparing to do another spark cap and we've put cotton flock in between the two halves. Here's the ramp at the end to support the fibers. And there we're filling that small cavity between the two halves with cotton flocks. After that we'll paint the whole area with resin and start with the pre-cut layers of unidirectional glass. So the third spark cap is complete. I'm going to turn it over and remove the plywood temporary ramp and prepare the other side. Here's the last spark cap ready for laminating. Just going to thoroughly sand that trough all the way down. Put the cotton flock in and lay up the final spar cap. Here I'm preparing the first spar for the external shear web layers and I've marked out where the spar is going to be trimmed off. There you can see 668 millimeters from the pin. These dimensions you can get from page W16.2. The end of the shear layers, the external shear layers, are a meter in from the center of the aircraft. So from that point there, measure a meter, which takes you to about there. That's where the shear layers are going to end. What I've just done now is I've ground off, or I've flattened this whole surface in preparation for those layers. I've ground off the trough in which the spar was made, that 190 gram glass that formed the trough, I've actually ground away. And there where the tip of the pencil is, you can see, is the outside of the spar cap and I've carefully ground off the, the 190 gram glass without actually cutting into the spar cap itself and I've done that all the way back to one meter. With the spar flat on the table like it is now I'm going to put on those four external 410 gram layers. Once they're on both sides then it'll be time to wrap the spar. Have both spars laid out ready for the external shear web layers. Five layers of that 410 gram glass, 45 degree. I'm going to go on the last meter of the wing. Yeah, the first layer is on, four more to go. Thoroughly wet out the area with resin and then lay down the cloth, wet that out. Both sides of the spa have now got the external shear webs on. Five layers of 410 gram glass at 45 degrees. And we're now ready to wrap this area in the pin, around the pin area, 200 millimeters either side of the pin using 500 gram UD glass four layers as per the manual 
and at the end of the wing, six layers for the last hundred millimeters. We radius the edges just enough to allow the glass to pass around the edge easily. All the bond areas have been suitably roughened as well. There we've applied four strips of 100 millimeters wide next to each other, pulled tightly around, and then wet out. We're now going to wrap it with peel ply, narrow strips pulled tight to try and contain the whole lot against the spar. Here are the two spars placed one on top of each other. All the wrapping is complete and I'm busy trimming off the end of the spars. This is best done with a hacksaw. Due to the very thick lamination the grinder tends to burn it so I'm using a hacksaw and slowly cutting through the spar end. We're now preparing the cores for bonding in of the spar and we have to cut back this little piece off the end of station one page w16.2 in the manual gives the dimension for this cutoff for the split line on the express it's 1122 millimeters back from station two and on the motor glider 922 back from station two Here we're cutting off the end piece and we're going to keep it for when we make the wing root area ultimately. We've laid out all the foam, lower blocks, and we've put packaging tape on all the joints where micro could seep through prevent the wing from sticking to the lower foam blocks. I'm busy gluing the blocks together with micro balloon and resin mix in a thin slurry and we're also putting in the aileron pushrod bushes and spoiler pushrod bushes with micro. There's the Teflon bush. There the wing is all glued together with the spar in place using the thin micro slurry and we've used packaging tape stretched taut from the table around the wing and back onto the table to hold all the sections together whilst they're bonding. Used about 350 grams of resin mixed with micro for the whole job. There's no need for the micro to squeeze out everywhere because once you actually lay out the skins the resin is going to fill the gaps between the micro or rather between the sections just ensure that the spar is nicely flush with the polystyrene all the way down the spar must definitely not be proud of the polystyrene anyway if anything it must be slightly below and then once the wing skins are in place you can then fill in the slight depression on the top but if it's high you would send sand through the skins which is not acceptable Make sure that the leading edge is nice and straight and the trailing edge and everything is nicely in line before you leave this to set. We're now ready to skin the top surface of the wing. There's the 410 gram cloth laid out but we've moved it back slightly so that we can put down the peel ply for the aileron cutout. The aileron cutout is marked on the foam with pencil and I've cut 40 six millimeter wide pieces of peel ply which are going to first get put down onto the foam with resin exactly on the aileron cutout. When you come to cut the aileron out eventually you'll be able to rip this piece of peel ply out and cleanly remove all the foam beads from the fiberglass which will save a lot of sanding. We're going to do the same along the trailing edge of the wing. The first task is to mix resin and make a micro slurry and put it on all the foam and then the peel ply and then the wing skins. Along the leading edge I've cut back some of the lower foam to allow the fiberglass to wrap around the leading edge. Also placed a piece of masking tape all the way along the bottom. We'll fiberglass onto the masking tape and that'll allow an easy way of trimming the glass to a straight edge without damaging the foam later. Along the trailing edge I've also cut the foam off 
roughly at the same angle as the top surface of the wing and put packaging tape along the lower foam. That will allow the glass fibre to drape nicely over with no air bubbles but not attached to the lower jig. When we bonded the foam to the spa we had to cut back a little bit of a recess to get around the wrapping in this area and the whole spa cap has been thoroughly roughened to allow good grip between the top skin and the wing spa. Very important bond bit. This is the consistency of the micro we're using. It's quite runny and applying it with a squeegee forcing it into the into the polystyrene make sure that, make sure you don't get any micro on the spa there must be a proper bond between the wing skin and the spa cap and micro is not a structural adhesive the peel ply is wet out and in position and we're now ready for the wing skinning Two layers of glass are now on, the 45 degree 410 layer and the 190 gram layer and the white that you see on the top is dry micro that I've sprinkled onto the glass and then rubbed in by hand just to finish off. The spa was wet out thoroughly and then the glass pressed down into it to make sure that there's a very good bond between the spa and the wing skins. In a few hours time once the glass is partly or rather the resin is partly cured I'm going to knife trim this edge here on the masking tape. The top surface is now cured and we've turned the wing over and we're preparing for the skinning of the lower side of the wing. This area will need to be thoroughly roughened for the lower skin to attach to the top skin. The trailing edge tang is going to have to be removed. That's here. We're going to cut in with the hacksaw blade there, remove this polystyrene and then rip out the peel ply that we put in previously there. So as to get the bottom skin to close out with the top skin. and get a good bond in this area. This is how the peel ply rips out, lifting the last bit of polystyrene out. There's the trailing edge all cleaned up, ready for the lower skin. After ripping out the peel ply, I've sanded this to a gradual gradient onto the glass here. The leading edge has been roughened all the way down and this edge of the glass has been beveled off using a block. That's pretty much this angle to bevel it off so that you won't feel a step in the glass here. By at least 25 millimeters, preferably 40 millimeters, all the way around and it's been roughened up to about there. I've cut away a bit of the foam here to allow the glass to go around and not foul with this bottom foam. The bottom surface is now ready for glassing. I've applied the micro, micro slurry to the whole surface, avoiding the spa itself. And I'm about to put down the peel ply on the aileron cutout. And the trailing edge as well is also prepared for the glassing. Lightly The lower skin is now done. The two layers of glass are on the 410 gram and the 190 gram. We've got a good overlap on the leading edge. To ensure that the trailing edge is absolutely straight, I've taken a length of steel, wrapped it in packaging tape and placed it on the trailing edge, just to ensure that there are absolutely no waves in that trailing edge. The white surface on the skin is a layer of dry micro that I've laid onto the wet glass and rubbed it in by hand 
this just eases the finishing process somewhat. Before leaving the wing for the night to cure make sure that it's resting absolutely perfectly in the foam blocks to ensure that the twist of the wing, the washout is correct. The best way to do this is to check that the spy is lying directly over the marks on the foam blocks. Here's the first ring completed and removed from the foam and in fact it's placed on the ground in the lower foam core just to stabilize it and ensure that there's absolutely no twist whilst it's curing. The bottom skin is only 24 hours old now so for quite a few days I'm going to leave it in this position to prevent any possible twist. There you can see the peel ply for the aileron cutout. Here we're preparing for the next wing. Here's the lower foam laid out and stuck together with packaging tape. The tape will also prevent the micro from sticking the wing to the foam, but we can remove it later. The wing is now trimmed and I'm putting micro in that slight depression on the top of the spar. I'm using fast hardener I'm mixing in 30% micro by mass. I've put the micro in with the putty knife and I'm using my straight edge which I'm bending to suit the shape of the wing much like we did the fuselage and I'm slowly splining it into the groove. Just to move quite slowly that it doesn't rip bits of the micro out. There's the micro in the spar trough, and it's virtually the same sh or the required shape of the wing. It's going to require very little sanding to get this to the correct shape. Here yeah, I've taken some of the scrap foam from around the wing. And I've bonded it onto the tip with micro and once that's set we're going to start shaping the wing tip. There's the left wing tip. I've shaped it. I've bonded on a block of foam with micro and then I've shaped it and applied micro and we're ready to lay on the two layers of 190 gram glass overlapping about 60 to 70 millimeters onto the wing. The wing has been roughened there. Up to approximately 100 millimeters behind the spar, this top surface is level with the wing top surface, and then from about 100 millimeters behind the spar, this ridge continues pretty much at the same height all the way back to a point out there, and from here down to the Turning into the wing is approximately 200 millimeters diagonal distance measured across there. And I've just shaped this to the right sort of shape. There you can see the radius that I've used. Once this glass is cured, I'll turn the wing over and then shape the other side. Yeah, I've finished shaping the bottom of the wing tip. On the rear edge, you can see the fiberglass that I've exposed here, so the top and bottom skins attach. That goes all the way along here. Around the front, the glass is going to attach here to the top skin, so I've roughened that area. But around about here where the edge gets quite sharp and the glass won't drape easily I've made a little trough into which we're going to put cotton flock which will connect the skins nicely because you don't want a crack forming there at the tip. Roughened again about 60 or 70 millimeters overlap here onto the lower surface of the wing so that the skins attach securely. Here's the other tip. 
and there are the various tools that I use to shape the wing tip. There's a front view to get an idea of the shape I've used. And a view from behind the other tip. I'm now going to apply the two layers of 190 gram glass at 45 degrees, same as for the top surface. With the wing inverted like this, I've now trued up the trailing edge with a long straight sanding block to the correct dimension. And now I've put micro in this recess at the trailing edge and I'm about to spline it smooth. Bending the spline to the right shape. last task remaining to structurally complete the wings is to make the end rib. I'm going to trim the ends of the skins flush with the foam and then I'm going to gouge out approximately 15 millimeters of foam and then I'm going to lay 190 gram glass in there at 45 degrees attaching to the rear face of the spar and the front face of the spar. Once painting is complete We'll cut out the ailerons and form the C-section spars and hinge them and also cut out the cavity for the aileron bell cranks and if a spoiler is to be used on the other side cut that out. This is an express wing without spoiler the motor glider will always have a spoiler. Here I've started gouging out the polystyrene to form the root rib. To make this easy what I've done is I've taken an end mill bit and I put it in a, dr in a drilling machine and I have the block of wood with a hole through it and I've set it up so that once the end mill goes through the wooden block there's just 15 millimeters protruding out the other side as you can see there and then I've used it like that working all the way along to get a fairly even removal of 15 millimeters of material. I then also managed to lift the peel ply with this blade and then ripped it out leaving this edge clean and ready for bonding of the glass. Final task is just to sand this whole area nice and smooth. We'll then apply a micro slurry and put on the layers of glass that form the root drip. There are the two layers of 190 gram glass in for the rib and once that's cured we'll trim off the edges make a nice flush edge. About a 25 to 40 mm overlap onto the spar. Once it's cured we can cut out those holes for the bushes and insert the te a teflon bush in that position. Here I'm starting with a carry through spar. To speed things up in this case I'm using two carry through spars which have been joined together at the factory on a jig which simulates the end of the wing. Looking inside you can see these seven layers of 280 gram glass on either side which you would normally form on the end of your particular wing but in this case we formed it on a jig in the factory but from here on the process will be similar to a normal procedure. On the top of the spar plank you can see there the pencil line as per page CT1 this should ideally have been trimmed off before joining the two together, but I'm busy doing it now. In the center is the joystick pivot bolt drilled beforehand and countersunk from the inside. And there is a pilot hole for where the wing pin will ultimately go. And the same on the other side. Those will increase to 40 millimeters a bit later on to put in the bushes. This channel that's been formed here 
is now going to receive the plywood inserts and then the UD and finally the wrapping. In the plan it calls for a short section of plywood at the center and then foam outboard of that. Here we've opted to use plywood all the way through. This will give a slight weight penalty but it's going to make it a lot simpler. I've come up there with the shape of plywood that we require and the way we've done that is we've shaped this template and we're leaving just enough space here to accept the 38 layers of UD that must fit in there and ultimately be flush with the surface here. The UD works out at between 0.4 and 0.5 millimeters per layer so ideally you need to leave just on 19 millimeters of space here. I've then cut 17 pieces of plywood of 6.5 millimeter which will be stacked and laminated in that space there. One could use fewer laminations of a thicker plywood as well. The top of the carry through spa will have a similar installation of plywood. The shape is just slightly different but the requirements are the same. Come up with a shape that's going to give you enough space for those 38 layers of UD here at the center. Those layers do take off to nothing at the end of the plywood here as per the plan. The May 2005 revision of the plan on page CT1 has changed the diagram slightly to allow a flat section along the center of the spa here, carry through spa. This is purely to allow the wrapping to be performed more easily so that you're not wrapping around a tapered section but the two sides will be parallel this side and the other side to ease the wrapping process. The wrapping around the center of this carry through spa is absolutely vital. The carry through spa has been trimmed and the top plywood inserts are in position. We've made the shape of the plywood inserts such that the 38 layers of UD can fit in above the plywood leaving approximately 19 millimeters there tapering off to nothing at this position where we run out to the top of the spar cap. We're going to bond those in tonight and then once they're cured flatten the top of the plywood off ensuring that there is in fact sufficient space for the UD layers to go in. The outside plywood has been radiused and you can see the radius all along this edge because the area where it fits into has got a fillet in it so that allows it to go in completely. Here we're using 17 pieces of 6.5 millimeter plywood but we're going to recommend to builders to use fewer pieces of 22 millimeter birch plywood in future to save all the cutting and sanding required. There are the plywood laminations in place. We first painted a thin layer of cotton flock and resin into the trough and then each piece of ply we painted on the same thin cotton flock resin mixture and then they were quite they were a snug fit before the cotton flock was on but once that thin layer of cotton flock was on all the pieces of plywood the 17 pieces pushed in quite firmly but just to hold the ends down we've put on a piece of polystyrene and a block of wood and a clamp just to hold all the layers down each ply piece down nicely at the ends and once that's cured we'll grind it flat and put in the 38 layers of UD on top of that and the same on the other side. The plywood has now been bonded into both sides of the carry through spa and using the grinder I've leveled all the tops of the plywood pieces and I've ensured that I've got the pliers bonded in and using the grinder I've ground down all the ends of the ply to be flush and here I've ensured that there's 19 millimeters at the center. We've got to put 38 layers of UD into this trough here. The shortest layer is going to be 150 millimeters long and the longest layer will be the full length closing out the end of the ply up to right here.
I've ensured that this edge is thoroughly ground. I've used the grinder so that we get a good grip between the edges of the UD and that spark plug there. Now I'm ready to laminate in the 38 layers and I've marked out graduations there for layer 1 through to 38 and there's the pre-cut UD glass 110 millimeters wide and using extra slow resin I'm going to paint it in there and start laying in the layers one by one and squeegeeing out the excess resin. Here I'm busy with the tenth layer 28 to go There are all 38 layers now in place and the trough is full. Once that's cured, we'll grind it smooth and turn it over to the other side and then prepare for wrapping. I've now ground the carry through spar ready for the wrapping. But before we do that, I'm adding these screws here through the spar plank into the wood. These are not normally used, however we do recommend if you use the factory built carry through spar, the one that's built on the steel jig in the factory, to allow for various dihedrals of different aircraft. We've made the we've made this aperture in here for the end of the wing bigger than what you would normally require. And the result is that there is a thinner piece of plywood top and bottom. That white template that you see there is in fact the shape of the plywood inserts that we put in. If you were to build the carry through spar on your wings, you'd probably find this is a little bit wider. Now to allow for this reduced dimension here, we're doing two things. One is we're inserting these 70 millimeter long 5.5 millimeter stainless steel wood screws in those four positions there, there's the center line 60 millimeters between and approximately 20 millimeters from the center we're going to put those in we're going to pour in some resin cotton flux mixture and then screw the screw in and in addition we're going to widen the wrapping to 220 millimeters it's 180 in the plan and we're going to increase it to six wraps we're only doing this on the lower side of the carry through spot in other words for the positive G load and when you put the screws in from the other side, just make sure they're about 10 mil staggered so that the two ends of the screw don't clash. I'm putting the screws approximately 15 millimeters from the edge of the plywood. I've drawn the plywood shape on the top here and 15 millimeters in from the edge of the wood to the center line of the screw. Try not to get the screws too. There are the four screws on the aft face. There's the hole for the joystick pivot. And along the top edge here, I've beveled the rear plank to suit the seat module. Remember there's going to be 3mm of wrapping on top of this. So I put it in the aircraft, put in the seat module and check that there is in fact a 3mm gap here at least and bevel accordingly. There are the four screws on the front face at a slightly different spacing than the rear ones so that they don't clash. And all the other edges have got a slight radius on to assist with the wrapping. And we're going to wrap two wraps of 110 millimeters, one there and one there, to make a total of 220 millimeter wrapping on this one. There, the first wrapping half is complete, 110 wide, four and a half meters approximately does the six wraps. And here we're busy with the next lot, and pulling it very as tight as you can, and then wetting it out rotating the carry through spar on the trestles. Keep one person keeping it tight and then the other person wetting it out. There we've finished wrapping the center of the carry through spar and put, we've put peel ply on as well. Here we're drilling the 40 millimeter hole for the wing pin bush in a drill press. We've put blocks of wood in between to stop the two pushing together. Quite a large force is required using a 40 millimeter spade cutter. Here I've bonded in the bushes for the wing pins. I've I roughened the bushes and then put cotton flock in the hole and on the bush and I put release agent on the pin and then assemble the whole lot. I'm going to leave it to cure like this.
make sure the bushes are absolutely perpendicular to the spar planks in that plane and that plane. Here I've got the wings set up with the correct dihedral with the carry through spar in position. The purpose here is to mark the 40 millimeter holes for the bushes through the wings. I'm using a laser level to get the dihedral set up. This is an express wing, so the wingtip is 333 millimeters higher. The leading edge of the wingtip is 333 millimeters higher than the leading edge here at the root. And there you can see the little red laser dot that's projected down to the leading edge at the tip. And if you drop a tape measure from the red dot here, it should be 333 millimeters down to the leading edge here to indicate that we've got the right dihedral which is 3.7 degrees. More importantly at this stage we've got a straight edge under the wing. As per the manual it's touching the trailing edge underneath and it's resting against the bottom of the spar and that should be absolutely level. Put a spirit level along that piece of wood there and the other wing should be identical. If you don't get this right then your aircraft is going to fly one wing low, so that's critical. And you can also just check the wing tips using the same method. The washout should be present and they should be slightly nose down in relation to the root. The carry through spar faces should be absolutely vertical. So in other words they are perpendicular to the piece of wood that we have there. So that's level and the carry through spar is absolutely vertical. This wing root area has had extra filler put on to fair in the wing with the thick, extra thickening here where the wrapping is. That's been done and I'm now placing a straight edge along the top of the wing. It's resting on the wing just ahead of the spar. It's flush all the way down on the wing and then I'm positioning the carry through spar so that the front, the rear face of the front plank of the carry through spar is just below the straight edge in that position there. So that is the vertical position of the carry through spar. I've also put shims in, 6mm plywood there and behind and below. The G clamp is just to hold the carry through spar in the correct position. The exact dihedral will be set ultimately with shims on the end of the wing stub at the center because this is a factory assembled carry through spar with the extra space inside. So we'll as I said, except the dihedral exactly later on, but for now it is pretty close. Once you're happy with all of this, take a very sharp scribe and scribe this 25mm hole on the wing root in all four positions, front and back of each wing pin. And then after that we'll disassemble the whole lot and drill that 40mm hole through through the wing root. It works. We've now drilled the 40mm hole for the wing bush using that spade cutter. Drilled a pilot hole from either side, made sure that they connected and then drilled through. The idea is to have the hole slightly bigger than the bush so that there's some space for the cotton flock around it, approximately a millimeter and that allows you a little bit of latitude in setting up the incidence ultimately. I'm busy reassembling the whole lot so that we can check the incidence of the two wings to make sure it's the same before finally removing, removing it all, roughening those bushes and then bonding them in with cotton flock. These bushes have also been shortened to suit the aperture in the carry through swell. This one measures 105 millimeters from inner face to inner face of those bushes. So I've shortened the bush to 105 millimeters. From there to there, 105. An easy way to roughen this is to rotate the bush in a lathe or drill press or similar device and then hold a angle grinder disc to it. And you can see those nice grooves created in the outside which will bond well with the cotton flock. I mixed cotton flock with resin to bond in the bushes. Now I've roughened the bushes again. Make sure that you don't touch it with your fingers. 
So it's been roughened and it's going to go straight in now. There's cotton flock on the bush and I'm going to rotate it as I push it in. Try not to squeeze off too much of the cotton flock. I've wrapped packaging tape around there to lessen the chance of it sticking to the carry through spar. And I'll just cut that out with a blade. That portion of the pin goes through. Yeah, the bushes are bonded in. Finally check that the dihedral is correct and that the incidence under each wing is, is the same. And also check that tip to tip the wings are in line. I used the laser at the end there, the laser sight, and made sure that the spar, in this case the rear edge of the spar was in a straight line right the way through the carry through spar to the other wing tip. With this project we used the factory made carry through spar as mentioned before which meant that here at the center <coughs> the carry through spar was bigger than the end of the wing. So to make up the difference I've made these plywood inserts which has turned out in my case to be three six millimeter pieces at the top and two at the bottom and to determine this I set up the wing with the correct dihedral here I've got the root resting on stands and the tip is 333 millimeters higher that's the leading edge I set that up exactly and then I put on the carry through spar at the center and made it absolutely level and then I looked in from the one end and measured that we came out to approximately 18 millimeters at the top and 12 millimeters at the bottom I then put release agent on the inside of the carry through and then tack these in position with cotton flock. I then removed the carry through spar and I've put in cotton flock into the, the voids and ground it all to be nice and square. I then did the same to the other wing. Once this is all cured, I'll reassemble the two wings with the carry through spar and make sure that the dihedral is in fact correct. On the back of the carry through spar, I've opened up the hole for the joystick pivot bolt. It's a 10 millimeter countersunk cap head bolt inserted from the inside. And we previously countersunk the head. Here we're preparing for the wing test. We've got the stress wings inverted, supported at the end tip temporarily, halfway down, and supported in the carry through spar, which is attached or is supported in brackets, supported by the one of the brackets simulating a fuselage edge on the forklift. There's some conveyor belting down the wing spar onto which we're going to load the weight. We pre mark the weights that have got to be put in the various bays as per the loading schedule. To protect the wingtip, we put it on a roller so that as the scent arises, the tip can run along the roller and hopefully not damage the wings. Okay, we're about to start the wing test.
test was successful. We measured 438.5 millimeters deflection and the test has been signed off and it will be put into the aircraft logbook. After the wing test we thoroughly inspected the carry through spar and the wings and all seem to be fine. I've now put the carry through spar into the fuselage and attached the wings At the moment the undercarriage is off and the wings are supported on stands and the fuselage is in fact resting on the wings. The wing tips are not supported in any way. The only support is here under the wing spar on the left hand side and the right hand side. The next task is to ensure that the incidence is correct of the wing so I'm going to put straight edges under the wing and make sure that it's at exactly the same angle as the canopy sole. And then I'm also going to check that the dihedral is correct in relation to the canopy saw. And then finally take a measurement from wingtip to the top of the fin. Once all those measurements are correct, we'll glass in the carry through spar. Last night I tacked in the carry through spar with the cotton flock after having set up the wings correctly in relation to the fuselage. I established a point on the wing here on the trailing edge that is the same distance in from the root on both wings and I used it as a reference point that's out here near the tip and then I measured from that point across to the center of the fin diagonally made those two the same and of course made the distance from the center line of the aircraft out to this point the same for both wings. I also rigged up a gut line from wingtip to wingtip spaced up on this set of spaces here and I made the same spacer arrangement on the other side and that gut line passes over the center of the aircraft and I've ensured that the gut line passes just above the canopy sill by the, with the same gap on both sides. During all of this the wing is supported on blocks and the fuselage rests on the wing. Finally, I checked that the underside of the wing, defined by that straight edge, which is tangential to the bottom of the wing and touching the trading edge, I ensured that that angle is the same as the canopy saw. And to do that, I used this adjustable protractor. Now that the cotton flock, you can see I've used some cotton flock. I used fast, uh, fast hardener. This carry through spar is now secure. I'm going to remove the wings to make it easier to get in and glass all around the carry through spar. The vertical position of the carry through spar is also important. Ensure that it does fit with the underside of the seat module by putting the seat module in at some stage and just confirming that this rear face of the carry through spar does contact the bottom of the seat module. I've now glassed in the six layers in the undercarriage bay. They extend halfway up the carry through spar and all the way up that plywood bulkhead that you see there. Six layers of 280 gram glass at 45 degrees. On the front of the carry through spar, 130 millimeters wide, I've got five layers. Up the edges I put in that cardboard insert to close off that hole and I've put in five layers there and on this side. I'm going to bond in the carry through spar now whilst the other resin has, has not yet set. It'll save some sanding. Ideally this should be sandblasted in this case I've chosen to grind it with a grinder but make sure it's absolutely free of scale and roughened and I've now mixed up cotton flock and I'm going to bond this in. This one I've chosen to weld at the center but in the kit you also receive a steel bracket that attaches to these four points to prevent having to weld that joint. 
the steel backing for the undercarriage is now bonded in using cotton blocks and I've held it in position with two temporary 10mm bolts there's the one, there's the other one force the cotton flock in all the way around the steel backing and make sure to clean it up properly before it sets it's a lot easier to clean it now than when it's cured there you can see the cotton flock between the steel and the rear face of the carry through spar Well, those temporary bolts have been waxed so that we can get them out again once it's cured. Here I've added three layers of 280 gram glass, 100 millimeters wide on the outside of the carry through spar, attaching it to the side of the fuselage and the rear of the carry through spar. Here we're busy with the rear wing attach. What we've got here is a composite tube that we made by putting release agent on this piece of 38mm OD aluminium tubing we then wrapped 410 gram glass around it we used a one meter long piece which ended up giving a wall thickness of three and a half millimeters one meter of 410 gram glass the 45 degree biaxial glass wrapped it around until the one meter was on and then once it had cured we pulled it off and cut two short lengths approximately 150 millimeters long and that tube is going to go into the wing at the rear attach point as you can see there that hole is approximately 300 millimeters from the trailing edge but you must make it to suit the exact position of your rear bulkhead in the fuselage which was fitted earlier you need to cut a 1.8 meter long piece of this 38 millimeter OD aluminium tube. It's the thick walled one of 3 millimeters that's going to pass through the fuselage at that position. It will ultimately be attached to this bulkhead, this rear bulkhead in the fuselage. We're now going to set up the wings with this tube in position and bond those composite tubes into the wings. Now we're applying release wax to the end of the tube so that it doesn't stick up with the composite tube that's going to go over there. I've closed the end of the composite tube with packaging tape to prevent any cotton flock going in there and the outside of the tube has been roughened. The hole in the wing we've uh, made oval and cleaned up down onto the lower skin so you can see where the fiberglass has been roughened and done the same on the top skin to get a good bond between the composite tube and the wing skins. Here we've reassembled the wing to let the cotton flock cure with the tube in exactly the correct position. There you can see that on the top skin where the foam has been removed and the skin was roughened and that now is bonding to the composite tube and the same on the bottom. We've also built up a flox bead all the way around there and there'll be further means of strengthening this attachment coming later including the extra layers on the top of the wing in the area of the wing wall. At this stage just double check that the tube is the same distance aft of the spar on both sides to ensure that it is parallel to the wing spar. The next phase will be to attach the tube through the aircraft to this rear bulkhead. The rear wing attached tube is now bonded in place. Put cotton flock behind it and then two layers of 190 gram glass over it onto the bulkhead and an extra two layers in each corner as per the manual. Where it exits the fuselage I've also put four layers of 190 gram glass narrow 100 millimeter wide strips all the way around the tube onto the side of the fuselage. Here's the start of the wing root fillet. We've taken the foam that was cut off when the wing was manufactured and this is the piece that goes up to station one that's where station one would have been and just tacking it in place with blobs of micro and attaching it to the rear attached tube make sure that no micro goes onto the wing this is to define this edge here which must mate exactly with the wing wing root 
once this is set up we can even remove the wing and start to fare in the wing root fillet the front block is not yet in position I must still cut the hole through it to allow the wing pin to be extracted here I'm busy shaping the wing root fillet I've taken scrap foam and bonded it in position with micro and I'm starting to shape it with a rasp ultimately we'll probably offer this in the kit as an option as a pre-molded wing root fillet but this is one way of making it here I'm preparing for a preliminary engine run on this Aero V engine that I've installed the fuel system is in place standby fuel pump gas escalator is in place the battery is installed on the firewall secondary ignition system is installed there you can see the coils we've hooked up a light to indicate whether or not we have oil pressure as we don't have any engine instruments connected I've installed a temporary propeller it's not the right diameter and pitch but it's adequate to just test run the exhaust system is installed as is the aero carb which I've placed in a horizontal position on this aeroplane having had that elbow installed this is going to be the nose wheel aircraft so the aero carb would have been in the way of the nose wheel assembly I have a fire extinguisher ready just in case and we're ready to go Switch on, mixture rich, bottle set. During all of this the tail was very securely tied down and the aircraft was well chocked. Obviously a preferable way of testing the engine is when the aircraft is complete with somebody sitting in the cockpit monitoring the instruments and with the brakes on. Here I finished assembling the master cylinder assembly. They're the two Grove master cylinders and the laser cut aluminium mountings as detailed in the plans. Now because this is a nose wheel whisper there isn't a bulkhead to mount the brake master cylinders on so I've had to manufacture this plywood piece to mount the cylinders on. They're going to mount like that. Now what I've done is I've tacked this in place with 
quick set epoxy and I'm now going to glass it in place with two layers of 190 gram on either side of the plywood onto the floor which I've roughened. The top you can see is shaped to suit the seat module exactly. There's the cutout in the seat module that the two brake levers are going to go through. In the tail drago whisper you would just melt the master cylinder to the rear of the rear undercarriage bracket which would, which would be in this exact same position. That measures 153 millimeters inside to inside face. Here I've temporarily installed a joystick mechanism and I've painted the carry through steel backing that the undercarriage mounts to. This here is normally a piece of mild steel angle for this main undercarriage bolt but on the nose wheel whisper the aileron push rod has to come over there and it would fall so I've gone for a 10 millimeter thick piece of mild steel there to spread the load. There are the two elevator cables just to set everything up I've temporarily I haven't crimped these cables yet I've got them attached with cable ties and that's where they go through the bulkhead behind the seats. There you can see the position of the two Teflon guides in relation to the rear wing attached tube. There are the two cables as they exit the rear of that bulkhead. And there they go through the bulkhead halfway down the fuselage. I've also set up the elevator bell crank temporarily in the fin area. I ascertained the position of this bush by putting on the horizontal tail plane and measuring the axis of rotation of the hinge and the center of that bush is exactly on that point. There's the mass balance arm. I've made the cutout in the forward fin spar. As per the plans I haven't cut into the rib. There you can see I've stopped short there and I'll open up the top of this slot enough to allow the full travel of the elevator. The weights I'm going to use are a series of these washers. I'm going to add a whole lot more to that bolt there. I'm using a 10mm bolt and I've had to shorten the end of this steel mass balance arm so that it doesn't foul the front of the fin in this area. Here's the elevator bell crank or rather the elevator pulley bracket mounted. That's 35 millimeters from the back of that cutout to the center of these front bolts and there's the minimum size cutout that one can have to allow full travel of the cables going up to this bell crank. There's a view from inside showing the elevator cables routing down the inside of the fuselage. I've also started routing the brake tubes, the nylon brake tubes. I'm running them up the front face of the undercarriage. Remember this is the nose wheel whisper. Things will be slightly different with the tail dragger. And then I'm routing the tube below the carry through spar and drilling a hole for it to come out and meet up with the master cylinder at that point. And the same for the other side. Here I'm preparing to bond in this elevator bell crank bush. Here's the bush which I've roughened extensively and try not to touch it again now between now and bonding it in. There that area has also been roughened thoroughly. I'm going to put cotton flock around here. Make sure you don't get any on the pivot shaft and then I'm going to reassemble the left fin skin. There's the cotton flock around the bush. Now I'm going to assemble the left fin skin. I'll do the left bush in a second operation. There I've attached the left fin skin temporarily. I'm just using pop rivets which I'll drill out again or one can use Clicos. And that's to ensure that that aileron bell crank is straight, making the bush straight. Now you can see the cotton flock holding the bush in place. Once the epoxy has partially cured you can get your finger in there and form that cotton flock into a nice radius. There I've attached the center lap strap mounting points. This is the nose wheel whisper so there is a bulkhead. The bulkhead directly behind the undercarriage 
attachment channel that can be used for seat belt attach points. Unlike in the tail dragger where you have to make attachment points on the floor. And the outer lap strap attachments can be made with this bolt, 8mm bolt with a large fender washer on both sides. And the bolt head is in the wing root area. There the master cylinder is mounted on that mounting bracket. Here's one of the elevator hinges, piano hinges, and I'm showing here the hardware used to attach it. The hardware list in the manual shows those countersunk stainless steel screws, plus those nylocks, plus those tinnerman washers. These are used to attach the piano hinge, as can be seen there, 11 in total per hinge. The tinnerman washer in conjunction with the countersunk screw spreads the load nicely into the fiberglass, minimizing the chance of it pulling through. Instead of the imperial hardware, one can use countersunk stainless steel cap head screws, M4 by 10, plus an M4 nylock nut, plus the Tinnaman, the Imperial Tinnaman washer. That's what I've done here. The decision whether to use metric or aircraft hardware rests with your local civil aviation authority and whoever's inspecting your aircraft. Clear this up before making a decision. The same hardware and means of attachment can be used on the aileron piano hinges. Here I'm showing how the piano hinge pin is secured. The pin is made slightly shorter than the actual piano hinge and the one end I have flattened to allow the to prevent the pin from moving out this end of the hinge and the other end as I said the pin is slightly shorter than the hinge which allows one to drill a one to one and a half millimeter hole there and lock wire it. There are other methods as well to retain the, the, the hinge pin but this is the method we use. Here's a view of the underside showing the nylock nuts under the piano hinge. Obviously one drills the segment of hinge in line with where the screw is. In other words, this segment moves with this screw head here, which means that that slight overhang of the Tillman washer there is not going to cause any fouling. Here I've made the elevator drive here I've laid up the six layers of 190 gram glass for the elevator connection and as detailed in the manual I've got packaging tape down first as release and then I've put on the six layers and then I've put packaging tape over so as to pull the glass nicely around this very sharp edge here. Once this is cured I'll take it off and trim it to the 50 millimeter width required. And I'm ready to close the fin. There's the pito in place, top rudder hinge backing plate is in place as is the ground plane and the elevator bell crank. I've had the elevators on and established the correct mass for the mass balance and I've put in enough washers to just balance the elevators. The aerial has got a ground plane half millimeter aluminium bonded and pop riveted in just high enough to avoid fouling with the mass balance arm in the up position. I've stripped off the 615 millimeters of coax shielding and that now becomes the aerial and the coax shielding itself is attached to the ground plane with that terminal that you can see there. Coax shielding I've run down here to act as Part of the ground plane. Here's the pito, 5mm stainless steel, the pito and the static. The static has got the four 1mm holes drilled in there. I've bonded all of this in at the top of the fin and used 5mm inside diameter clear PVC tubing which runs down the aft face of the front fin spar through the ground plane and down through the hole in the front fin spot. These cables have been swaged and all the bolts have been torqued. As you can see there's free movement there 
due to the bush that has been put in. That backing plate for the horizontal stab attach pins is bonded in place. This little bulkhead for the horizontal stab attach bolt has been glassed in place. And there's the bolt coming up from inside the fuselage with a large washer on the lower side. I've also got the rudder cables in with the Teflon tube here running through the two fin spars. The Teflon tube is 315 millimeters long and it's been secured to the front fin spar with locking wire both sides of the fin spar. Here's the elevator pulleys. Make sure that this mass balance arm doesn't foul anywhere through its full range of travel and make sure that you've opened up enough of a slot here as per the manual to allow the full travel. This cutout here is in case you ever need to get the mass balance arm out which is going to be difficult but possible by reaching in through the holes in the fin, removing these three bolts and then taking the mass balance arm out. It is possible. The one bush is already bonded in place there and as we bond on the fin skin we're going to bond this bush to the fin skin. Everything's been roughened, make sure you don't touch anything. All bond areas have been prepared, thoroughly roughened, not blown off with compressed air because it might have oil in it, brushed off with a dry brush. Same on the fin skin, everything has been roughened. This is the 5.3G test on Murray Dixon's wings. Just setting up for the lift now, all the weight is on. 1489 kilograms per side. Okay, let's go. This bay one two eighty one kilograms, bay two two seventy three. Two fifty two thirty one eighty two point six one forty four point five and the last four bay twenty eight point five five twenty five point one five twenty one point two five and eleven point two five. Here are the results of the load test. 1147 millimeters. And there are the masses loaded onto the various station. Ten stations in all. I'm now ready to bond in the seat module. All the bond areas have been roughened seat module fits properly. Joystick mechanism is done although we can still get to that through the access hole. Teflon bushes are in place and lock wired. Seat belt attach points are in. Brake master cylinder assembly is in. This is the nose wheel airplane that's why it's got that little small bulkhead for the brakes. Seat module has been roughened all the way around on the bond areas including where it contacts the top of this, the carry through spar and the rear bulkhead. Here yeah, all the cotton flock is on, ready for bonding. That's the sort of size mound of cotton flock I've used. I've used slow hardener. There it is on the carry through spar, on the rear bulkhead, on the brake, master cylinder bracket, and of course on that front bulkhead you can just see it there. I've smeared a thin layer on all the bond areas 
of the seat module as well. In total I've used about 400 grams. The seat module is now in place and held in by rivets every 100 millimeters or so. I climbed in through that rear bulkhead and removed all the excess from inside. Much easier to remove it now than once it's set. And everywhere where you can get your arm in, wipe away the excess glue just leaving a bead in the corner. And that's how much I was able to recover. So that's approximately 100 grams that I've actually removed. Here I'm busy installing the rudder and I've put in the rudder stops. There's a 6mm cap screw with a large washer either side of the spar with a plain nut this side and a nylock nut on the inside and directly below that is the Teflon tube. You can see I've had to slot it to allow it to move as the rudder hinges. You can see the relative position between the two. The rudder travel must be 30 degrees either way. There you can see the horn contacting the bolt head. Actually travel. Here's the horn to cable attach. AN4-10A bolt, castle nut, split pin and a spacer to allow you to torque the bolt and still have free motion here. There it goes into the stop and 30 degrees left, 30 degrees right. Here I'm busy with the fuel tank installation. There you can see the 63 by 63 by 3 millimeter angle attached to the firewall and on it is some rubber strip to prevent chafing. Also all the bolts through the firewall in the fuel tank area have been made captive with cotton flock so that we can loosen them from the firewall side without having to remove the tank each time. That includes the engine mount bolts, you can see them there with a 3mm steel backing washer that's all been bonded to the firewall. I put anti-chafe rubber strips on the tank as you can see there. There are the 6mm bolts holding the aluminium angles in place. The line of bolts is 290mm below the top of the firewall. There I've done the seat belt shoulder strap attachment point in the rear fuselage. I've also cut the slots for the shoulder harness through the seat module. There are the two anchor nuts and countersink screws to hold in the cover at the seat back. Same with the front cover. The tank is now finally installed. There's the breather line exiting the fuselage just ahead of the undercarriage. And it's plumbed to the connection under the tank. That pipe goes to the top of the tank inside. And here's where it exits the bottom of the aeroplane. It's a 10 millimeter outside diameter aluminium tube. You can see I've cut it to gain a slight positive pressure in the tank. I've also cut through the firewall, drilled through the firewall and put in that return line there which goes to the top of the tank. That's an option. I'm using a return line with the Aero V carb so that I can run a fuel pump. There it exits the firewall at the front. Drill the hole bigger than necessary and then force flocks around the tube to avoid any possible fretting with the sharp stainless steel firewall. There's the top of the fin. I've begun fairing it to blend with the top of the rudder. I've also bonded the 10mm outside diameter aluminium tube to the front of the spring steel undercarriage legs. On the tail dragger this would be on the reverse side of the undercarriage.
I've tacked it in place with cotton flock. Once it's cured, I'll clean it up and fair it with fiberglass. Here I'm busy setting up the rudder shear web. In this case I'm making the rudder match the fin. You can also make the fin match the rudder. But here I've got the shear web bolted to the rudder hinges. And you can see the washers on the rear face. There's the lower hinge and the horn all in position as per the dimensions on the manual. I'm going to glue on the foam blocks now. There's the lower rudder foam block and it's been opened out to go around the bolt heads. There's for the horn and the lower rudder hinge. We're going to bond that onto the shear web now. We ended up bonding the rudder in the polystyrene jig. It was not possible to do it on the aircraft. Just made a recess in the polystyrene to allow the rudder horn to protrude into it. The rudder is now ready for glassing. The foam is all attached with micro and I've radius the front of the rudder to ensure that we get full travel 30 degrees either way without fouling over here. The top's been shaped to suit the fin. This bottom has been rounded and here in the front taken off enough to ensure that it doesn't foul with the fin spar. Now the trough just aft of the shear web is going to be made for the rovings. And the rovings are going to go all the way down here to the horn and then backwards. Prior to gluing on the foam, we roughened the rear face of the shear web because it's vital that you get a good connection between the roving bundle and the aft face of the shear web. This is a previously completed rudder. Here you can see the rounded bottom and some drain holes to allow any water out that might collect inside the rudder. Remember that the foam is porous and if left parked in the rain you can get water collecting inside the foam. You must always have drain holes at the lowest point to allow any water out. There's where the roving trough is going to go. I'm stopping it just short of the trailing edge and you can see it lines up with the horn. It's to try and feed the horn loads into the skin and there it goes up the aft face of the shear web past the hinge and stopping just short of the tip. A 10 by 10 triangular roving trough as per the manual and then the skin is going to be two layers of 195 gram per square meter cloth at 45 degrees and we would use the normal fashion doing the, this left face first peel ply down the back once it's cured Cut the tang off, remove the peel ply and then glass the other side. Obviously with an adequate overlap on this. Here I've got the aircraft upside down and I'm working on the wing root fillets. With the wings on and the aircraft the right way up, we glass the top of the wing root fillet. First shaped it to suit the wing exactly, then put on a one layer of 195 gram glass. That defined this trailing edge of the wing root. I've now turned it over and I've put on one layer of 190 gram glass on the underside. Once this is all set up and the whole shape is defined, then I'll start filling with very dry micro. Fill in any of the big troughs and then I'm going to put further layers of glass on top of that. Areas like this I've just glassed and once cured I'll, as I said, put on dry micro profile it approximately and then put further layers of fiberglass on as per the manual. Here in the vicinity of the spar, this void, this gap here to be filled and you want a very thin edge here to prevent this from being higher than the rest of the wing but just to make sure that you don't damage it when you put the wing on and off I put on a approximately a one millimeter plastic spacer here just to space this out slightly from the wing spar. Here I'm preparing the undercarriage legs. Here's the undercarriage legs which I'm preparing for the glassing. Using a grinder 
with a 80 grit disc on it. I've taken off any possible nicks, any stress raises in the steel. I've carefully ground away all those marks. I've also bonded on the aluminium tube in which the brake line runs. I've temporarily bonded it on with cotton flocks. This is the nose wheel whisper. So this rounded edge of the spring steel is going to actually be the trailing edge. And I'll have to form this into a trading edge shape. I'm going to do that with micro, shape it and then glass it. Here I've profiled the dry micro to pretty much the shape that I want ultimately. The major imperfections are all filled up. Now I'm going to put on further layers of glass. In this case I'm going to put on one layer of 410 over this entire area. There's the brake line exiting, brake tube, and the top's also done. I had the aircraft right way up to do that. Here's the plywood skid, this being a nose wheel aircraft. Here I've applied the layer of 410 gram glass, and like on the wing I've sprinkled dry micro on to help the finishing process. Here's the undercarriage leg ready for painting. There's the tube for the brake line, and there's the trailing edge. I used a piece of scrap timber which I cut on a circular saw to a triangular shape and bonded it on the trailing edge of the spring with 500 epoxy and then glassed over the whole lot. Saved a bit of time. Here's the other leg I'm busy brushing on some filler spray. Once that's cured I'll use spot putty for any minor imperfections and then I'll paint them out. The wing root fillets are now nearly complete. Here I've got primer brushed on and I've closed out the end of the root rip with two layers of 190 gram glass. I gouged out and then sanded about 20 millimeters of the foam and then put in the, the glass. I used a large washer to spline in the fillet in the corner here and on the other side. There's the top side. Here I've made the tubes into which the wing pins fit. To do this I took a scrap piece of 45mm outside diameter tube, waxed it and then laid up some 410 gram glass, approximately three layers around it. Once it cured, I split it and removed it, roughened the outside, gouged out a bit of foam around the front here so as to get a good bond. I then put it in position over the actual wing pin, wing pin tube, and to align it I've got two washers, 45mm washers with a 16mm hole in the center. Two of them, there's one here that you can see and then one deeper in to ensure that this thing is absolutely aligned and once it's cured I'll grind that off flush with the wing and make a little cover to fit in the front. There the aircraft is upside down but there's the little tube that's been finished off. All the filling and sanding is now complete we're about to put on the first layer of white paint. I've used this 2K product Acroline APU 105 as the filler spray and then I've used this spot putty, Spiss Hacker spot putty 7715. With the aircraft upside down I'll paint underneath and as far around as I can. I'll also paint the sides of the fin. There's the white paint on the lower surface. Make sure that I've got a good gloss here on the portion that's going to be inaccessible once it's turned over. I've also painted the undercarriage legs so that once you put the aircraft right way up now it can go on its undercarriage finally.
Here we're preparing the tail plane for attachment. We've cut out 190 millimeters at the center. That's enough to get it past the fin. There are the phosphor bronze bushes in place with cotton flock. We drilled a 19 millimeter hole with a hole saw and inserted them. That gives you a 2 millimeter clearance to move the tail plane around and get it accurate. We've also put in the front tube for the front attach point. There you can see the 12 millimeter inside diameter mild steel tube which is bonded in place with cotton clocks. And the tail plane's in position and just to make sure that it's all straight whilst the cotton flock is setting let's make a few measurements. Here's a tape measure running from a center point on the top of the fuselage and we're measuring back to the trailing edge of the horizontal stabilizer and ensuring that the dimension is the same on both sides. To make sure the tail plane is horizontal I've put a straight edge across the canopy sills and there you can see from the front of the aircraft you can line up the tail plane to be precisely in line with the straight edge. I've now cut out the ailerons carefully marked out the ailerons on the wing from the dimensions in the manual and using that one millimeter angle grinder disc I cut out the aileron and used a hacksaw blade to cut through the foam. I cut into the glass about three or four millimeters with the grinding disc and then cut through with the hacksaw blade. The dimensions are on page W36 and W16.2. Make sure that this cut and the one at the inboard end is parallel with the airflow of the aircraft. In other words, 90 degrees to the wing spar. Using a plank with nails set in it, 23 millimeters, I first gouged out the foam, roughly, and then sanded it with a sanding block. The peel ply that you laid down earlier on can now be ripped out. This helps to get a nice clean edge to avoid lots of sanding. Same, same at the ends. There the glass is in. Two layers of 190 at 45 all the way through and then five additional layers in the areas where the hinges attach. The additional layers must be on the top skin because that's where the hinge attaches and I can go halfway up the rear face as well. Elevators and ailerons ready for glassing. Same method. Stabilizer. Here are the aileron piano hinges which I'm preparing for installation. This hardware kit has come with MS2 0001-3 hinges which have got slightly different segment lengths to the one referred to in the manual. It's worked out that we need 14 segments which works out to 176 millimeters long. There you can see at each end of the hinge I've got a half segment. I've cut through and left a half segment at each end. I'll then drill through at points that correspond to each fixed segment. So on this closest side to me now, I'm going to drill there, skip that one, drill there, skip that one, drill there. A convenient edge distance is 5.5 millimeters. This makes sure the screw won't rip out of the hinge and it also allows just the correct spacing for the Tinnaman washer to line up with the edge of the fiberglass. There are the Tinnaman washers the countersunk screws and the nylock nuts. Here's the outboard hinge on the aileron. There you can see how the edge of the Tinnaman washer corresponds to the edge of the fiberglass. There's the one millimeter cut that we use to separate the aileron and here is the notch at each hinge point. I've temporarily installed the two outboard hinges found it easiest to mark the hole positions on this wing skin 
and then drill through with a sharp 4mm drill through the actual hinge in situ. Makes it easier to see. Here I'm making the elevators fit and to get the required down travel, the elevator is upside down at the moment, the stabilizer. Here at the center I've got to remove 7mm front and back and at the tip it reduces to 4mm front and back. There the strip's been cut off and you can see the required 59mm down movement at the trailing edge. Here I've prepared the aileron bell crank mechanism. There are the two laser cut 3mm aluminium plates. There's a spacer, I've used nylon this time. In there you can see the phosphor bronze bushes. And at the bottom is the anchor nut for the quarter inch bolt. Those two little holes are going to be used for lock wiring this bolt head ultimately. There's the cutout in the lower sur surface of the wing. I'm now going to glass inside of this cutout. You can see all the way around the edge I've gouged out a little triangle of foam and thoroughly roughened the inside face of the fiberglass. I'm going to put cotton flock in there so that when the glass goes in, the glass connects with the lower skin of the wing. Also, to be able to attach the belt crank mechanism, I'm using this aluminium angle backing which is going to go in first and then the glass layers are going to go on top of it and it will ultimately act as a backing into which we can rivet and attach that belt crank mechanism. The cut out here in the angle is just to allow clearance for the anchor nut. There are all the layers in the recess now. Three layers of 190 gram glass at 45 degrees throughout and then the additional five layers on the rear face. And the aluminium backing is also visible. To prevent the cotton flocks from getting into the anchor nut I've put some packaging tape over it. Thoroughly roughen the aluminium bracket where it's going to bond and also roughen the recess on the inside of the wing. Mix up some cotton flocks and put this in place with the pop rivets. There the bracket is bonded and pop riveted in place. You can see on the lower surface there I've drilled a number of 2mm holes to allow the cotton flocks to squeeze through and improve adhesion. Then I'm ready to insert the aileron horn. There's the cutout in the aileron. There's the horn itself. Two angle brackets attached to two pieces of 6.5mm plywood. And the shape of that plywood there is taken off template number 4, wing template number 4. This is the express. So the aileron is at station 4. And it's shaped to be a good fit into the aileron but not a press fit. If you make it a press fit you're going to get print through on the skins of the aileron. So it must be just about a millimeter loose and that gap will be filled with flocks. I've also got four five millimeter holes for pop rivets which will help to hold the horn onto the aileron. There the horn is in place. You can see the cotton flocks mound that I've made. It's in fact covering the cap screws and nuts. And under that is also the four 5mm pop rivets. I'll drill the holes for the bell crank rather the push rod attachment later. To allow full travel of the bell crank, I 
had to make this hole in the foam slightly oval. Ideally you should do that when you hotwire the hole in the foam or you can do it now. We used a 16 millimeter tube fed in from the root end and the end was slightly flared and we raised it up with a six millimeter rod pushed into the tube to hold it up and then someone moved it backwards and forwards at the root end and we gouged out some foam to allow the push rod to flex slightly. Before installing the push rod finally it's a good idea to ream the bushes, the Teflon bushes, to reduce the friction in the push rod. To do this I've made up a reamer. On this end I've got a 19mm countersink bit which I've just bonded to the end of the tube. And to the other end I've attached a drilling machine and I'm going to slowly feed in this long improvised reamer into the end of the wing to ream out the Teflon bushes. The aileron bell crank assembly is now complete and we've got 90 millimeters up travel and 45 millimeters down travel. And that occurs as the bell crank hits the two stops. This being the one stop, when the top of the pushrod tube contacts the 12mm spacer. And the other stop is when the bell crank contacts the actual aluminium extrusion up there. This bolt head, this AN4-17, will be replaced with one of the drilled head ultimately and that will be lock wired through those two holes there. On this wing we're also going to attach a mass balance system because the residual moment of the ailerons will definitely exceed that laid down in the manual. And this mass balance arm is going to attach to this bolt here which will be shortened and replaced. The reason this residual moment will be greater than the motor glider is because of the wide cord ailerons. Normally the motor glider wing doesn't require the mass balance, but if your motor glider aileron does exceed the residual moment in the manual, then it would be a good idea to attach the mass balance arm as per this Whisper Express wing. I'm now preparing for the installation of the aileron push rod, the one that goes to the stick, it's got to be cut to length. So I've prepared the joystick pivot and the mechanism as detailed in the plans. I've taken a scrap piece of 19mm aluminium tube and I've put it through this hole in the wing and ensured that it can reach the bottom of the stick in all the positions of travel. In fact, I've used a bit of sandpaper on this tube and sanded the hole to suit. On the wing root rib, I've put in the final Teflon tube. And you can see I've taken the cotton flock around the tube to ensure that it can't come loose. Because if this Teflon tube were ever to come loose, it could cause a jam between the rod end hinge mechanism here and the root rib. So make sure that, that can't ever dislodge. Here's the aileron push rods set up for final fitment. And this push rod in the wing has been cut to a length that gives you 50 millimeters. And that is with full aileron down travel. So that push rod is into the wing is to the tooth maximum. It's still able to move out. Here's the push rod that goes into the fuselage and there's the rod end that connects to the stick. This push rod measures 580 millimeters. That's not to rod end centers, that's the actual tube part. I've made an instrument panel from 3 millimeter birch plywood and I've painted it grey with air dry enamel. And then I've used white and blue aerosol and created this speckled effect. Here I'm putting on the registration letters. 
I've taken a string from the center of the prop hub and I attached it to the, end, to the end of the propeller blade and I strung it all the way to the rudder horn and that's the center line of the letters using a spray bottle with water mixed with a few drops of dishwashing liquid you spray a fine mist onto the area where you're going to put the stickers and also onto the back of the sticker itself that allows you to position it accurately once you're happy with the position squeeze out all the excess water with a cloth and then carefully peel back the applicator film and then once that's done squeeze out any remaining bubbles here I'm busy fitting the canopy frame I've had to cut it in a number of places and then I've got it into position I've also put in the bushes that stainless steel 6mm rod is released with wax and the bush is bonded to the canopy frame tacked in position with cotton flock there where I've had to cut the frame I've put tape around the back of it to prevent resin from getting on the aircraft and I've put in three layers of 190 gram glass to repair it I've ensured that there's a 4 millimeter cap all the way around so that the outside of the canopy is flush with the aircraft Here's the canopy latch bracket that I've put in place. I've put the front hole at 633 millimeters ahead of the rear edge of the canopy. I've defined the rear edge of the canopy as that intersection of lines, that sloping face, the rear face of the canopy, and the sill line where they meet. The tape measure is put there. And 633 ahead of that is this bolt. I've used a 6mm stainless steel cap screw which has passed through the bracket, the front hole of that bracket and I've set the whole lot in cotton flock roughened all the bond areas that bolt will be the pivot for the canopy opening arm and for the handle Here's the center canopy joint. I've tacked it in place with cotton flock. I've used a string down the center line of the aircraft right up to the top of the fin to get it absolutely in the middle of the aircraft. I've also tacked in 4mm thick aluminium blocks there where the attachment for the canopy hinges is going to be tapped in. Is the top cover and I've also put in a handle that can fold away to make the recess for the handle I put it in with packaging tape all around it and then I put in pl plasticine to form this shape and then I glassed over it there are the pivot pins also glassed in place Yeah, the center canopy strip is in place and I've put two layers of 190 gram glass over that intersection there and on the other side and I've also filled in this channel section all the way around with foam and put in micro in the corner we ground out a V and put in micro there and then I've ground it all flat and I'm preparing to put on the layer that closes the c-section here i'm already putting it on here i've applied the fiberglass on the canopy frame to close the c-section and whilst it's curing i've got it in place with the four pins in position with release agent on them obviously and then a heavy piece of steel to hold the frame down snugly in position because once this cures the frame will hold the shape that it has right now 
make sure that you've got that four millimeter gap all the way around for the perspex. I've now attached the perspex. What you need to do is place the canopy frame on the aircraft with the pins engaged and trim the perspex to suit that shape. If you try and attach the perspex to the frame off the aircraft, the frame deforms slightly and you won't get the exact fit. So once you've trimmed the perspex to the exact shape, you then bond it onto the frame whilst it's on the aircraft using the Seeker Flex products as per the manual. I'm now filling in the gap between the canopy frame and the fuselage. If necessary you need to do that with micro. I've put masking tape down on the canopy sill to make up a bit of thickness, about three layers of masking tape. Then I've put packaging tape down as release. I've put then micro on the bottom of the canopy frame. I've obviously ground that first to get a good key and I've also put a bit of micro on the actual aircraft saw. Now I'm going to close the canopy and then tomorrow I can clean this up and get a good fit between the canopy frame and the aircraft. They have waxed the pins once again so they don't stick. They have closed the canopy and squeezed away the excess micro on the sides. Once it's cured I'll open it and then fill in any voids that there are underneath. This way I will know the exact thickness of the micro required in this gap. These are the wheel spat mounting brackets which I'm about to install. Here are the wheel spat mounting brackets ready for installation. 2mm mild steel. I've added AN4 anchor nuts to the rear bolt because you won't be able to get in there to hold a nut. Here's the bracket installed. Make sure that there's clearance over here because as the brake pads wear so this caliper moves inwards and this end of the caliper must clear the bracket here otherwise you're going to start losing brakes. There's the outer bracket is the AN4 bolt with a drilled head which is going to get lock wired. This is the rear wing attached tube. We've had the wings installed and drilled the 8mm hole for the wing attach and then I've inserted a solid aluminium plug inside the tube to prevent any possible crushing when you tighten this bolt. The hole is drilled 30 millimeters out from the wing cut line. Here's the fuel cap cover which you can fabricate from any scrap piece of glass of about 150 diameter. There are a few cutouts that you make on the aircraft. Keep these and you can use one of these to make this cover. There's the latch mechanism. When you move this wire backwards, it disengages the latch and then you can pull the plug forwards and remove it. I've riveted on a spring clip at the rear. And I've taken a few segments of piano hinge at the forward edge, used a piece of piano hinge wire, bent a 90 degree angle on it and made a little slot. The spring clip I've taken off a normal fabric inspection cover that you'd find on a fabric aircraft. Here I've made up a bulkhead for the spat. 25 millimeter polystyrene I've used and I've shaped it to fit into the spat at a position 260 millimeters back from this front edge 
of this rear spat. So from here back to the front face of the polystyrene is 260 millimeters. In the manual there's now a template for this bulkhead. I bonded it in with micro and then I'm going to put three layers of 190 gram glass on the front of it, extending 25 millimeters onto the edge of the spat. Everything's been roughened. And don't force that bulkhead in too tight because then you're going to get a print through on the outside of the spat with time. I'm now busy with the canopy joint, the piece of fiberglass that goes on the outside of the canopy. It's going to be bonded over there with Seeker. The black that you see is the primer. I've roughened the perspex in the area where there's going to be bonding and I've brushed on this Seeker primer. And there it is there. The primer is absolutely vital for this bond. Without it, there's virtually no grip to the perspex. The actual strip I made by laying up three layers of 190 gram glass on a flat surface. I just used this piece of 75 millimeter angle with some packaging tape on it. I laid it up and then trimmed it and I've also applied the primer to it. I've got the smooth side down at the moment which is going to be the under which is going to be the outside of the cover once it's bonded on. Once this primer has cured completely or dried I'm going to put the seeker on and then bond it onto the canopy. The edges of the canopy I've also profiled to suit the aeroplane by applying micro in places and in other places for example here on the left front edge I've had to grind the perspex down a little bit to get it to suit the aircraft shape perfectly. I've now bonded the fiberglass strip on with Sika and I've pulled it down tight with masking tape stretch it as tight as you can stretch it over the canopy. I also use a little roller to push down the fiberglass and get out any bubbles. On either side of the fiberglass I had a piece of masking tape which once I done all the squeezing out of the seeker flex I pulled it off and it gives a clean edge so that you have very little trimming or cleaning up to do later on. The canopy has now been fitted and the edge painted the center strip is also painted. There's one of the side arms. Cowling is also complete. There's the air inlet for the oil cooler. And there's a small air inlet for the car. There's the top cowling. On this one I've put in two holes to let out some of the hot air when you park the aircraft and the engine releases a lot of heat. There's the nose wheel assembly with a composite undercarriage leg that must still be removed and painted. I'm about to make the little cover between the horizontal stab and the fin. There I've got the main attach bolt in position and I've bonded on a washer to true up the face onto which the bolt head pulls. And I'm going to put release tape in this area and lay up the little removable cover. While I'm about it I'm also going to put in cotton flock in this little recess underneath the stabilizer. I've put release tape on the aircraft here and I've roughened the underside of the stab and I'm going to force cotton flock in there to make a little pad for the stabilizer to pull down onto. Obviously I've released the bolt as well, in fact I wrapped some packaging tape around the bolt and put grease in the threaded portion in the fin. In the fin. Yeah, the packaging tape is in place and I'm going to lay up layers of glass in that fillet. Take it off, trim it, fill and sand it. It finally is attached just by tape. There's the completed fairing. I've trimmed it and it's ready for filling and sanding now. 
can see it goes over that pivot at the back there to keep the corrosion off. Under the stab there's that little pad of cotton flock. You can see it's been trimmed as well. Here we've got the aircraft rigged and ready for flying. I'm just going to show a few details on the engine installation. This is the Aero V 2.2 litre motor with an aero carb that we've mounted underneath horizontally. The reason for that was to miss the or to clear the nose wheel. We've got a composite nose gear leg and a free car string nose wheel. In the center of the screen now is the oil cooler which I'm feeding with an updraft system from a NACA duct on the lower cowling. We've got a simple 4 into one type exhaust system which goes into the tunnel under the aircraft and there's a silencer in there. There I've got a flex joint followed by a free flow silencer and then a 90 degree bend at the end to make sure that the hot exhaust gases don't go straight onto the fiberglass underside of the aeroplane. There's the oil temperature probe standard VDO probe which I've put into the sump plug, I've tapped it. There's a K&N air filter. Throttle control lock wired and a mixture control cable running across to the other side there. There's the nose wheel leg. I've wrapped it in a foil type tape to keep the heat off when the engine is stopped and there's a lot of heat in the cowling. I've also made two holes in the top cowling to let some heat out at this point. I'm running a non-standard second ignition. I've taken the Aero-V system off and I've replaced it with a Honda motorcycle unit which has a retard system to allow me to hand prop easily for starting. There are the coils and the two amplifiers mounted on the firewall. There's the gas -culator. After the gas -culator, I've got a fuel pump and then it runs almost to the aero carb and there's a T-piece with a return to tank. Here I'm trying to keep a reasonably constant fuel pressure at the aero carb. Here's the breather line. Make sure that this aluminium tube that's inserted into this rubber grommet here is cut off at an angle. If it's not, as you push it in, you can actually cause a blockage. The extra air duct is to run some cool air to the coils. This is the inside of the lower cowling. And you can see the NACA duct which feeds upwards to the oil cooler. And there's a small NACA duct which just allows some cool air in to the vicinity of the carburetor. We don't give ram air to the aero carb. There's the top cowling. And you can see those two extra holes there to allow a bit of air to escape after you've flown. So I've also installed the mass balances. There you can see them. I've got a lump of lead on the front of a solid fiberglass piece that I've cut out here. It's approximately 10 millimeters thick and it fits between these two aluminium tabs that are the aileron horn. There's the aileron horn. I've got the rod end on the outside of the mass balance arm. There's the mass balance. It goes to the full up position. The bell crank moves out the way. And we've found that to get the correct differential with the aileron neutral this bell crank must be absolutely straight like that, aligned with the airflow. Here's a close up of the bell crank. There's the AN 4 17 bolt lock wired. Here's the main wing pin. You can see the locking mechanism. Get it to the right torque and then drill through so that you can put in this cap screw with two jam nuts below. 
and that cap screw is long enough to actually enter into this composite tube here and we can make a little cover for here or put tape over there's the fuel breather under the belly of the fuselage there's the rear wing attach bolt there on the top surface we haven't installed it yet but it needs a special beveled washer to be made there's the finished instrument panel just the basics there's the fuel cutoff that's in the on position in the off position it's horizontally to the left master switch below it mixture control start button fuses and then four switches avionics fuel pump engine instruments and the fourth one is not used yet two place intercom and an icom ac20 radio ac200 radio two mag switches left hand one is the primary ignition of the aero v and the second one is that electronic ignition where the air exits the cowling i've made this little flap to assist in causing a low pressure as you put the cowling on you need to slide it in you can't do it before because it's got to clear the nose wheel i'm going to slide if i can remember how this goes There's the air exit flap in place, held in with four 832 countersink screws with anchor nuts.